Welcome everyone to um, today's um, meeting of finance and performance. Um, I will start the um, meeting with the Karakia. Whakataka toho kiti ura, whakataka toho kiti tonga, kia ma kina kina ki uta, kia ma tara tara ki tai, e hi aki ana te atakura, he tio, he huka, he hohu, Tihei Mariora. Welcome everyone. And um, if um, you intend to leave this meeting, um, could you please let the democracy advisor know? And that includes even if you are, um, if you hide your screen. And also if we come back from a break, if you could um, um, also make it known that you are actually there by putting your screen on at least for a short time and um, yes, and we should be fine. So thank you. Um, at this stage, morning tea will be around about 10.30. And um, yes, and, you, and the agenda this morning, we will, um, we will start with um, Wellington Airport. We'll go into, um, um, we'll have the public briefing. Then there will be some commercially sensitive information where we will then go into public excluded and deal with any or the public excluded um, parts of the agenda at that point following on. And then we will come back out of public excluded into, um, into public to deal with the, um, um, the audit and risk paper and the, um, and the development contributions. So that is roughly the order of the day. Um, I have ha got one apology from um, Mayor Foster for lateness. Are there any other apologies we would like to? Okay, so I'll move the, the motion that um, that the committee accepts the apology from Mayor Foster. Um, do I have a seconder? Um, thank you, Councillor Foon. Um, I've now put the motion forward. Could you please vote accordingly? Um, is that a yes, Deputy yes, Mayor? Yes, yes, thank yes. you. So well, that's 14 votes in favour. That's carried. Thank you. Um, and now we'll move on to conflict of interest declarations. Are there any um, conflicts of interest members would like to declare? I don't see anything. So um, I now will now move on to the confirmation of minutes. Um, I move the motion that um, the committee approves the minutes of the um, Puro Tahuak Finance and Performance Committee meeting held on the 16th of September, 2021, having been circulated and that they be taken as read and confirmed as an accurate record of that meeting. Um, do I have a seconder? Um, thank you, um, Councillor Fitzsimons. Um, I'll now put the motion, which has been moved and seconded. Um, please vote accordingly. Yes. That's 14 votes in favour. That has carried. Excellent. Thank you. Now, there are no items on the, that are not on the agenda. And there are also um, no requests for public participation. Um, and um, I know I've, I've, I've covered off briefly before, but in it, just to cover off the standing order um, 19.1, I accord precedence to some items of business so that the agenda is considered in the following order, which is the Wellington Airport Briefing Public, Wellington Airport Briefing Public Excluded, um, the attachments to the um, Audit and Risk um, Subcommittee, and um, the other papers, and then we will come out of... Um, um, as I said, come out of um, public exclude back into public with the development contributions, um, action tracking and um, forward program. And we should all be done and dusted in an hour. <laughs> Probably not, but anyway. So um, um, I think we now have the briefing from um, Wellington International Airport. Um, I think I can see um, you all in a meeting room. Um, 
Um, perhaps I can't, it's quite a small screen. So could I, could I just ask you just to introduce who, who's there in, in representing the airport? Yeah, Kira, thank you, Chair. Um, so, yeah, my name's Steve Sanderson. I'm the Chief Executive of Wellington Airport. And um, slightly behind me is Jenna Rayburn. And to on the other side of the table, starting from the front, is Chris, who is our new sustainability um, uh, officer. And behind him is... Um, I've forgotten your name. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Just joking. Um, Martin, who is our Chief Financial Officer. So um, if you allow me, I will just um, run through what we intend to cover um, this morning. Uh, first of all, we'll talk, uh, give us a update on the notice of requirement, which is the designations. Um, I will do that, um, followed by a seawall update, which again, I will do. And then I'll pass on to Chris to talk about sustainability um, and the initiatives that Wellington Airport uh, has um, commenced or planning to do. Um, and then Jenna will talk about um, uh, transport and then we'll go to the uh, um, not public excluded session, which uh, Martin will give an update on the airport's uh, finances. Um, it may be best, um, I suggest Chair, perhaps at the end of each of those topics that um, if there's any questions, um, rather than wait into the, wait into the end, because it will seem a little bit um, disrupted than otherwise. Um, does that meet your expectations? Um, yeah, that's fine. And to my um, colleagues, um, if you could, when we we have questions in that order that we um, keep to the subject matter that's just been um, presented to us on, um, and then hopefully we'll have then a wrap up for anything else that may not have been covered but is uh, is relevant to um, um, to the briefing. So yes, that sounds um, good. But thanks, Steve. Okay. Well, I will start on the notice of requirements. So um, councillors will be aware that the airport has um, started a process to put airport designations over the two pieces of land that, it's own, that it owns, and that being the main airport site and also lot one on the eastern side of the, of the current main site. So there was a council hearing um, and um, the independent directors assigned by council uh, made a recommendation to um, Wellington Airport with some conditions. Uh, Wellington Airport accepted that recommendation and, um, and we um, accepted the, uh, the designations. So there was a process where people can then um, appeal. We have received two appeals on the lot one, the eastern, on the eastern side of the airport, and we've uh, received one appeal on the main airport site. Um, that appeal is arguably out of scope and we will look to strike that out. Um, so the, we're expecting that the main airport site will be um, confirmed and the airport designation will be um, put down. So the two appeals on the eastern side, um, there will be a, um, a hearing and we're predicting sometime mid next year. Um, but there's a prelim, prelim hearing probably in the next uh, month or two and to set the timetable for that and we'll um, go forward on that. Um, so that's probably covers the um, update on the notice of requirement. Happy to take any questions on that. Are there any questions? Um, Councillor Panis. Thank you, Steve. Hi, how are you? Kira. Good. Hey, um, do you think it's really justified that we have to expand the airport because as I understand it, it's for things like catering services and rental cars. Is that the best use of the land? Um, there's many uses of the land on the eastern side and um, you'll see in our submissions that um, the, the several key ones are, um, you know, currently um, we have aircraft waiting for um, uh, you know, basically to tie themselves to air bridges or, or a parking lot, which which does consume um, environmental issues for us. Um, and it's also not optimised. Also, one of our um, big initiatives is actually on the eastern side, we want to build an energy centre. And for us to meet our um, carbon um, emission, uh, neutral emissions, um, we need to eliminate our gas, um, gas boilers, which is one of our um, largest carbon um, burns that we have. 
And the only way we can do that is to put ground source heating um, on the um, on the eastern side on lot one. So we want to cover that with all um, ground source heating and build the energy centre also on that land. So that is another use. Um, and then there will be the um, uh, when we actually move over there, we want to um, uh, put the and um, the space for aircraft to park. And um, obviously, this um, notice is being appealed. What is your view of your chance of success of winning? Um, we're very confident. I think the um, the recommendations from councillors, independent commissioners, were sound, um, and we accepted those recommendations. We didn't make any uh, changes to those, and um, so I think um, you know it was a, a very good. And recommendation and, and we accepted it so I think we're on strong ground but um, as we know we live in a democracy and and uh, you know people have the right to appeal through uh, the environment court. Last question Kevin you've just made that point about you're on strong ground um, <laughs> this of course is one of the issues with the airport. Um, are you still planning to expand the runway? Um, we as you know it is on hold um, and um, there's still an intention um, and sometime in the future to, to reopen that project, yes. Okay, and I understand there's quite a lot of other work that would come along with that if you, if you did do that. Um, there is like, quite a lot of work, but you know, we, you know, we're probably a couple of years away from even uh, reviewing that project. And I think you know, when, we, when we move to that, we need to consider, um, you know, because I think, you know, and this is just a view that there will be changes in aircraft types and aircraft usage of fuels. And um, so, you know, as we've heard that Airbus and Boeing are all looking at alternatives, whether that's um, a sustainable um, fuel types, um, hydro, electricity, and all those um, sorts of changes will dictate length of runways and amount of parking space that we need. And that's one of the reasons that we also need the Eastern um, side on lot one. Okay. Okay, so I just want to keep just to this part of the, um, the, the, the notice of requirement. So we can just keep your questions to that because there will be time for other parts of this presentation. Um, Councillor Rush. Uh, thanks, I, Steve um, and, and team. So yesterday we had uh, Jeff Weir from Friends of the Bay and Strathmore Park Residents Association come and talk to us very intelligently and, and openly. A couple of things he, he mentioned which I'd like to put to you he's been concerned that the level of consultation hasn't really been uh, as good as it could be do you think that there are some gaps in what you've been doing with the local community that that can be improved um, I you know that was all by advice and um, you know we did an open public sessions that ran for a couple of days um, so I think it's been extensive we've put brochures around the communities on on that part um, Look, I always think, you know, there's always a frustration what consultation, how long it runs for. And, um, you know, so, you know, we feel that we did a good job on, on consultation um, with those open public days um, where we put all our um, key, um, key witnesses and expert witnesses up for um, discussion with anybody that came through. Okay. Um, the other thing he was, you know, very supportive of the airport uh, as a business. Um, but there's concern about the air noise boundary. And you gave us some examples of Christchurch and Auckland, and Wellington's got a very small one comparatively. Is there anything we can do about that to, to keep the air noise boundary as wide as possible? I mean, is there a discussion that we can have to, to try and come up with a solution that can work? Yeah, thanks. Um, yeah, that is under review um, with the district plan, the air noise boundary, so we will go through that. Um, and um, there will be some alterations to the air noise boundary. But um, when it comes to the eastern side, um, which I think is what the focus is on, um, we accepted the recommendations of the independent uh, um, commissioners um, to limit um, the time that aircraft will um, have engines on, um, which I think is um, uh, it, um, aircraft can't run uh, after 10 p.m. and before 7 a.m., um, so it is quite restricted um, on that, which is, you know, a lot different to the main airport side. So I think we've done everything possible 
and with the yeah. um, also with the advice from our noise experts, and um, which also spoke at the um, at the hearing. Okay. Um, I'd like to follow up at another time, but um, you did mention an energy centre and my eyes lit up because that's what I do. Um, tell me a little bit more about that. Um, that's not our scope, Councillor. Yeah, that, um, yeah, yeah, okay. it, 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 I think Let's it's just on. a little bit because we're, we're going to be talking about the sustainability aspect a bit later right. on. So I Thanks, think, Steve. Yeah. Thanks, Steve. Okay, thank um, you. Debbie, um, you're free. <laughs> Thank you for coming, Steve, and others. It's good to see you. Um, I, do, I tried asking our officers about the air noise boundary yesterday, and I'm a little bit confused. Does it mean that where that boundary is beyond that, you have to do the inch noise insulating in houses? Is that the meaning? How does it how does it actually protect residents? That's what I'm interested to know. Yeah, so the air noise boundary, um, and depending where the houses fall within each um, decibel setting, so. Um, I think there's two um, uh, boundaries in terms of decibel setting. And if you fall within those boundaries, we have what's known as the Wellington Airport Noise Treatment um, Company, um, which then will um, put insulation or me and mechanical ventilation into those houses to, um, to minimise um, uh, noise. I think there's some 700 houses currently um, within the want um, noise treatment process. And, and how, how are you going with that noise treatment pro program? Because I do have different things from residents, depending on who you're talking to. How many yes. houses have been insulated? How many are waiting? 80. 80. So we did 80 uh, this year. Okay. 80 over the time. Uh, 80 over the time. Yeah. Our 80th house. Yeah. yeah. So, sorry. Oh, and how many roughly are still to go? Um, I'd have to come back to you with on those numbers, oh, okay. none of those on hand. Uh, oh, okay, uh, okay. And I guess it is a bit relevant to the designation. As you have um, land in Bridge Street that houses were removed from, are you planning to do anything on that side of the airport? Because um, there was something that was raised about that land not being purposed and then wanting more land on the east. Should we cover that in sustainability? Yeah, uh, that's still one side of Bridge Street, but we don't have any on yeah. the eastern side. Yeah, so I was just checking um, whether it was covered in the sustainability issue, but we have no plans on the, on that on that piece of land, um, Sarah. Okay. Yep, yeah. except to keep a green space. Yeah. And another thing we did yesterday was talking about the road. We, we know that you're working with our officers and we're grateful for that. Um, but do you see a, a possibility of maintaining public access um, around between Miramar South and um, Moa Point? I, th I think the best way to answer that it will be collaboration between with the airport and council and as I suggested to you um, on the eastern um, side of our land um, we're quite open to um, to talk to council about building a road around the perimeter of that and so we could um, in, uh, invest that to council to do actually build that road um, I would like to make the point that we're currently working with Wellington, um, Wellington Water and, and you'll be mm. aware of the minimising the, the sludge mm. at Mower Point. Um, that when that project starts, it will limit access or close access to, um, to the south um, for up to 18 months. And yeah, so I, I realise that. And, and I guess okay, you uh, something. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I'm just conscious of time. So, um, Councillor Neil and Young, are your questions in relation to the notice of requirement? No, mine's about the road. With, with all due respect, we don't often get a chance to talk to the airport, so... I, I, absolutely. I'm just saying is we, they've got a presentation to go through. Oh, okay. And then I said at the end, we will okay. do any questions that haven't been covered off. So, it's really about that. I just want to make sure we get through the presentation. Um, so that we're not duplicating anything a bit later on. Um, so I'm sure there's time to circle back on, on that, but unless it's, if this is about the notice of requirement that they've just on that section. Um, um, Councillor O'Neill. Thank you. I've got um, two questions. One question was just about that green space that was mentioned. Am I able to ask, ask that question? Is that in relation to the you... notice of requirement? I mean, I think we could. We, we, let's it's... let. The, I think we've got to let them finish off their presentation. Okay, yeah. so I think um, yeah. So let's let, let let's wrap that up near the end, and then if there's any relevant questions in that, 
Um, uh, do you have another question about the, the notice? Yes, I do. Yeah. yeah, thank you. Yeah, the question was simply arose because it had already been discussed for a number of minutes, so yeah. that's why I had a follow-up yeah. one. Um, yeah. So thank you all for coming to talk to us today. My question, I guess, on behalf of the community is after this notice um, of requirement is issued, what plans do you have um, to update the community with, you know, things have changed quite a lot since your 2040 plan. Um, what, what are your plans to continue engaging with community after this is issued? Um, well, the focus, um, assuming that the main site um, is confirmed, um, which we're expecting in the next um, short while, um, then there is an outline plan of works um, that the airport can undertake within that designation. Um, so, you know, in terms of consultation, um, we haven't, when, we're not actually, I mean, our CapEx program is currently on hold with COVID. And um, so, um, you know, at this point in time, it is, it is pure essential CapEx that we're working on. So, um, and as far as the Eastern side, and um, that, designation will probably be a um, minimum of six months away before we get to the environment court. So I can't really comment on that until that desig designation and notice is um, confirmed. I'd be really cool. happy to bring my team in to talk to you, Councillor, um, about our community engagement and anything that you think we could and should be doing. More than happy to have a follow up about that. Thank you, Jenna. Awesome. I know that was something that was yeah, raised yesterday. Okay. Thank you. Um, Councillor Young? Oh, sorry, I said my question is about the road, so I can wait for Okay, enough. all right, thank you. Um, so I'll hand it back over to, um, um, to Wellington Airport just to carry on with the next part of your presentation. Okay, thank you, Chair. Um, so just the, uh, my next update was just on the seawall update, um, which is, um, will be short. Um, we have just um, run a, um, an RFI for an engineering company and we've just about selected one um, and we're working with them now to um, to do two designs um, and then once we've got those preliminary designs we will then look for the resource consents um, to build um, and particularly the Lyle Bay side um, which is the most critical um, seawall upgrade that we need to do and for, um, so those two um, preliminary designs will include the protection of council's assets and the other uh, one will be the protection of the airport. And um, so we're, we're expecting those preliminary designs and some rough order of costs for those around about February, March next year. And we will come back to Wellington City Council to discuss those costs, um, particularly around um, if council want to make their contribution towards the protection of their assets, which is namely the sewage pipes and the road. Thank you. Um, is there, are there any questions just on that, um, on the extension? Oh, not extension, sorry. I don't, don't mention that word, but the, um, the seawall. Uh, Councillor Young, you don't have a question on that? Uh, correct. Yeah, okay. Um, Councillor Foon? Um, kia ora, Steve and team. Thanks so much for coming in today. Um, just on the... Um, the capital to do that, how are you going with talking with council about that and how are we looking, you know, uh, yeah, where is that landed in terms of what council is expected to be investing? Um, at this point, it was in your long-term plan that we wanted you to keep that in, which was the $70 million. Um, I understand that was taken out, um, but we're asking you to reconsider that $70 million um, uh, to, um, you know, to, for your contribution towards the uh, protection of your assets, which is um, behind the seawalls, which is namely the road and the sewage pipes. So, as I said, we'll come back um, once we've got those preliminary uh, designs and, and we'll have that discussion with you. But um, I think you should consider um, that contribution that we will be asking for you to make. Great. And, and Steve, just to confirm, so um, what percentage of the um, contribution was expected or hoped for from Wellington City? Um, you know, it's real rough order of costs. Yeah, I know. Um, 
as you as you could expect, we yeah. <laughs> yeah, the design is actually um, you know the preliminary design is is still being done, and then it will be a rough order of cost as well. Um, but at this, you know, the you know, I guess if I use a wet finger, we're we're talking about council's contribution for protection of your assets about seventy million dollars. Okay. And we're expecting the whole, the whole project to be in the order of, you know, in the 200 million uh, mark. Great. Thank you. That answers my question. Thank you. Okay. Um, thank you on that. And noting that you'll be coming back to us probably February, March, which will be um, the timing will probably likely form as part of the annual plan um, work that will be going on at that stage. Um, okay. So um, next part, Steve. Um, yes, so I'm going to hand on the, over to Chris, who will talk about our sustainability initiatives and uh, plans as well. Okay, Sorry. thank you. Welcome, Chris. Thank you very much, Kilda. All it's a, it's a pleasure to be able to meet you uh, and to be able to catch up about uh, all things airport. Now, um, I'm aware that we're pretty short on time, so I just want to be able to give you a good high level idea of what we're considering in the sustainability field. Uh, so, pretty much looking at this in two ways we've got our scope three emissions so that's everything airline based now and then uh, aside from that we've got our airport direct one and two uh, scope one and two shall we say related sustainability initiatives so just touching on the airline side first and foremost this is this is the big one this is the I guess the elephant in the room when it comes to especially emissions in relations to aviation now we've got a number of uh, number of things we're working on in this space to and here try and unbind aircraft movement and any related growth to a growth in emissions, which has been quite a concern globally. So what we're working on at the moment is we've broken it down into how we're going to address each type of aviation that the airport handles. So first of all, just looking at regional travel. So this is a big one. Wellington's the is the premier regional airport in New Zealand. And uh, the what, what, what's being looked at at the moment, and you might have seen a Sounds Air's uh, proposition and commitment to starting a electrification of their fleet for 26. And this is just the beginning of work in that area. So what the airport's trying to work on doing right now is making sure that we're definitely a vector to making this happen rather than a hindrance. So we're working with, uh, we're currently and actively working with uh, engineering consultants, uh, consultancies and sounds here as well as other organizations to help make sure that we're planning and we're going to be ready to have the infrastructure in place by the time those aircraft start to be introduced. Uh, so aside from regional travel and battery powered aircraft, we're looking at we're also looking at handling the bigger stuff. So things like domestic aviation, uh, wide bodies, bigger, bigger planes pretty much. And in that space, we've been working heavily with Air New Zealand, who you may be aware, and making huge leaps and strides, not just in New Zealand, but globally, to try and make the conversion to SAFs, so that's Sustainable Aviation Fuels, which is supposed to have an impact on, uh, sorry, a reduction in emissions in comparison to regular Jet A1 fuel by about 80%. So we're working for them, again, to understand what do we need to do to be you know, an enabler, and not just an enabler, but a driver. So we're looking at helping what we need to do to create uh, sorry, to help with SAF production and also more importantly with storage, which is a big concern in terms of volumes. So those are the two things that we're looking at is uh, technology changes, which are going to help, as I said, unbind a growth in emissions from a growth in air traffic. But as for the right now, what we're currently working on is, uh, is sorry, network and, uh, oper and aircraft operation optimization. So we're looking at something called ACDM. Uh, one of the acronyms, which pretty much looks at uh, optimizing port to port operations. So that means if, if you've got a plane leaving Auckland or Wellington, it's not going to get held up. It's not going to be stuck on the taxiway burning fuel unnecessarily. It's not going to be flying loops due to a hold up up the other end. It's all in sync. So right now we're working, we're collaborating with uh, Civil Aviation Authority with Air New Zealand and with the Airways to get the ball rolling on getting that up and running. So that's happening right now. So those are the key sort of prongs that we're using to tackle the big issue, the, the jet fuel burning issue. Um, now, in terms of our other sustainability related initiatives from the airport side, what we've, we've got targets in mind to make sure that we're held to account and that we follow through. So you may have heard of our 30, 30, 30 targets. So that's, we're looking by the year 2030, we want to achieve a 30% reduction in emissions and energy, which inherently go together, uh, waste production, sorry, waste to landfill, and also usage of potable water. So 
on the energy front, the big one for that the terminal is directly responsible for is, and which Steve touched on before, is our HVAC systems. So that's our heating, uh, cooling, ventilation, and such. So that's the big that's the big ticket item for the airport business. Now we've we've started to take uh, approaches so far with the building analytics and management system, which essentially makes it a smart building. So rather than having an on button, it understands the activity going on within the terminal and can adjust accordingly, which has been delivering substantial benefits so far. Uh, in our energy usage. But aside from that, again, not to dance around the issue, we are aware of our ch the necessity to, to address uh, our chiller, our chillers, and more importantly, our boilers, which rely on natural gas. Now, that, that's, a, that's a big, coming up with a solution is quite a big, it's a big one. And um, we're looking at opportunities to be able to tackle that head on. So one of the big advantages of a potential airport expansion in, is being allowed, should we call rare access to underground to be able to use a ground sourced uh, heating and ventilation system, because uh, it's quite hard to rip up an airport and throw it under as it is. So, so we're looking to the future. So what that'll allow us to do is eliminate natural gas, which is a huge source of emissions for us and also optimize the equipment that we have. Now, alongside this, we're looking at alternative energy usage. So we're looking at installing solar installations at the moment. So for again, talks with uh, consultancies and companies to explore that. And also within the next financial year, we look, we're looking at replacing all uh, airfield lighting from the current sodium powered lamps to LEDs. So more ambient lighting, but also a big reduction in energy usage. Now on the waste side, this is quite a big one, not just for the airport, but across New Zealand is increases in waste and how to address that. Now, waste management, who uh, who's our uh, our waste contract supplier, we've been working with them heavily to for, to address the contamination issue, which is what results in a lot of waste going to landfill. Now, uh, so, and as part of that, we're really keen on making sure that we're smart about how we work with our green waste. So, touching on Bridge Street, so the eastern side remaining green, the western side, we're actually working with the local outfit. Uh, so, for the better good, and we're in the final stages. Uh, of getting a, a, a community garden going and which which will help create a circular economy. So rather than green waste, food waste, things like that, going direct to landfill, we're hoping to, it'll be going into the garden, which will then be able to produce food, which will be used back in the airport setting, creating that circle, which is something I'm really happy about. And it's been really exciting to pretty much just be there on the line. So, and it's exciting, it's happening, it's not a future thing. So, so that covers off the waste side uh, there. Now, the last one that we've got is water. So uh, forever, precious resource, I'm getting more and more so. And what we're looking at doing here is reducing unnecessary usage of water. So what we're current, in terms of technology, we're looking at to address that. We're looking at our rainwater harvesting. Uh, as we're all aware, we've got a big, we've got a big slanting roof and that's just one of the many advantages we can use to make sure that we're not, to make sure that we're using water that would otherwise just go to waste uh, for airport services. Now, um, that, that pretty much gives a bit of a high level overview of the approaches we have at tackling, uh, helping assist in tackling airline emissions, but also uh, addressing our own sustainability related uh, areas so with energy, waste and water. But this is what I want to talk about really quickly is um, our consideration. Are, are we considering everything? Uh, do we have everything in our sites? And I'd like and the evidence is that we are on the right track with this. Um, you might have heard, so GRES, which is a, it's an assessment of what it's our processes and considerations in place to make sure that we're handling sustainability responsibly and in line with global standards. And we achieved in the past financial year a score of 95 out of 100. So they put us as a number two airport in Australasia uh, for this assessment. So um, for us, that's an indication that we're on the right track. We're considering the right things and uh, we intend to do so moving forward. So. Um, just uh, in summary, I think that pretty much sums everything up at the high level on the sustainability front. But uh, if you have any questions, not just now, but down the track, please feel free to reach out to me and I'd be more than happy to, to, uh, to let you know what we're working on. Um, thank you, Chris. Now, I we've got six um, councillors wanting to ask questions. Could I ask councillors just to limit that to one question um, at this stage? So because we're um, just so we can get through this um, briefing. Um, and then, but I'm sure that if you've got some general questions, they can be dealt. If they can be dealt with offline, that would be great. We can we can then um, circulate a list to uh, Wellington Airport to be able to answer. Um, but Councillor Rush. Yeah, well, Chris, it would be good to catch up. I do have a number of other questions, but I'm just, I, I suppose, just asking you at this point about the electricity source. Um, have you had any discussions with the likes of Meridian to get, uh, you know, duly carbon-free accredited electricity or to 
I mean, I don't know what your power requirements are, but, you know, are you linking in with other major electricity users? I mean, we've got Greater Wellington's buses are all being electrified um, and we need to understand where that power is coming from. So is, are you integrating with other um, like-minded organisations that are high power users in trying to, um, I suppose, um, ensure power sources from renewables? Yeah, no, no, absolutely. Good question. Good question, Councillor Rush. Thank you. I'm, I appreciate that. So, absolutely. So, you're, you're right. This is a particularly energy dense part of Wellington. Um, so, not just with, the, of course, with the likes of NZ Bus, but also uh, with CCDHB just over the hill. So, we have been in discussions about what our steps are going forward um, because Wellington Electricity itself is spearheading a study into what the eastern future requirements will be. So, um, and it's it's a hard one at this stage to to know what where they're going with their study, but to try and be proactive in that space, we, to answer your question, we are working with other large consumers in the area. Okay. So, yeah. Make someone else go. Thank you. Um, Councillor Panis, re re refrain yourself from too many questions. <laughs> She's very excited. I know. Yeah, I, I, I will, Councillor, I will restrain myself. <laughs> right, well, um, you won't be surprised by my question, Steve. I'm going to be asking Chris about roading. So you're on this great sustainability journey, which is awesome. Are you supporting uh, more roading capacity to get to the airport? Or would you like people to arrive in a more sustainable way? Thank you. Uh, yeah, yeah, thanks, um, Councillor Panett, and um, the no surprises there. Um, Jenna's going to cover that in the transport section. Yeah, thank you. Um, um, Councillor for Simons. Yeah, I just wanted to say... Thanks so much for coming along. It's really great to see you and um, I'm fascinated by airports and how they operate, so I can't get enough of your answers. Um, I just really have a question, Steve. When I first got elected to council, I um, met up with you and you talked about the contribution that Celia Wade Brown had made as a director on the airport board in terms of really driving the airport's thinking on sustainability and waste. And I found that really interesting. And I was just wondering if you could share a bit of that history with other councillors, because I, I can see that it's advanced a long way since then, but I certainly found that um, educational and helpful, and I think my colleagues would enjoy hearing about it as well. Um, if you could just keep that very brief one-liner, because we do have this presentation to get through, and I'm sure it could be a whole history of what led to it, but if, is there, if there are any just one or two insights. Yeah, probably, yeah. I think the best way to answer that um, Councillor Fitzsimmons is, is I think any any makeup of any board, um, you know, the table should be, you know, across a broad um, spectrum, you know, everything from finance, law, um, operations, and and um, also, you know, particularly for airports, you know, um, somebody should represent, um, you know, strongly the social license to operate, and I think Celia. And did a great job there, you know. So that's probably the best way to answer the question is that, you know, a board should be um, not, you know, you shouldn't have a board full of accountants um, would be uh, be my advice. And I think if you look at the Wellington Airport Board, um, yeah, there's some strong candidates there and any future board. Um, we, we do have a matrix of skills that are required. Advice for life. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I'm Councillor O'Neill. Yeah, cool. Thank you. Um, it sounds really exciting. My question is around working with other airlines, and I wondered if you talked a little bit about the electrification of the fleet, um, but we know that that is a few years off. So I was just wondering um, what other ways the airport is working with airlines to try and reduce their admissions, because as we know, you guys don't actually make most of them, but it, but it, um, they are the other businesses that you engage with. So I was just wondering if you've got any target setting there or any incentives or relationships and what that looks like. Yeah, we have, I mean, as Chris said, the ACDM, which is the efficiency of aircraft leaving an airport and arriving at its destination, that the, there is no holdups. Um, also um, at the airport, we've electrified most of the air side now. So aircraft are not using the, their auxiliary um, power units. Um, so, and, you know, electric tugs um, and all the other um, vehicles around the airport, you know, we're slowly electrifying those as well. So, yeah, we're doing everything we can. 
And, uh, you know, I think um, also, you know, one, one of the big notes is that, you know, every um, new generation of jet engines are uh, hugely more efficient than the, pre uh, than the predecessors. That's right. And they're much quieter than traditional planes as well, which I'm sure our residents will be happy to hear. Um, just on the back of that, I guess, is there an ability for the airport to set, you know, uh, standards given we are, you are an international airport and Aotearoa New Zealand kind of around their own climate targets or when contracts come up, are there any other wiggle room aside from the assets that you own? But whether you're choosing whether or not to have host another service, so, absolutely. Um, so we do set standards, um, and we do even with actually not just with airlines, but with contractors as well, and the expectations when it comes to um, you know their carbon zero initiatives, um, and that goes alongside health and safety, um, and all the protocols that go with that as well. So the airport is in control of um, anybody that comes onto its um, onto its land. I think the other thing to think about is as more direct flights come into Wellington, often that reduces emissions at a national level. Um, so for example, um, while Auckland Airport has been largely closed, we've been hosting more direct flights from Northland. That means that those flights don't have to take off, land in Auckland, transfer to another plane, take off again, um, because it is that takeoff and landing, which has by far the highest fuel burn across the journey. So by eliminating one takeoff and landing from a journey, um, we can dramatically reduce emissions. So really encourage councillors not just to think about growth in Wellington in isolation, but to think about when Wellington Airport attracts new flights or more direct routes, what that actually means at a national level. Excellent, sorry, and I've just got one more question. So. Um, I'm really interested to hear at, within your sustainability goals how the airport measures um, their impact on the suburban community. So things like you mentioned before, green space that you own, um, what we're doing with that and how we can make that more sustainable. Um, and for example, not making the airport a car dependent um, sort of a sinkhole and, and other things like that. But yeah, I understand Jenna's going to talk about transport a little later but um, I, yeah when when you do the sustainability talk I'd be really interested to understand yeah us a part of a network as well. Um, we, we just had the, the this has just been the sustainability part of the presentation so yes, yes. yeah yeah so uh, what's what's the other specific question do you have? Um, it, was you around, it was just around it was just around you know sustainability is not just it, it includes green space and reducing car dependency. They're not kind of two different sections. Yeah. So I'm interested to hear how that relationship is merged. I think we'll probably leave that to the, I think that it's sort of that in straying into the transport link. So um, um, I think on that, um, on that thing now, I think we'll move to the transport links and then that might help on some of the questions that Councillor Neil has got. Okay, thanks Chair. We'll then, um, uh, Jenna will, talk on this subject. Yeah, great. Kia ora all. Um, nice to be here to give you a bit of an update. Um, I was just going to talk about um, Get Welly Moving and um, a bit about the Progress Wellington Coalition, which as you all know we're a part of, um, and Cobham Drive as part of that, and then just give a brief update on um, the airport bus service and what's happening there. Um, so broadly in terms of Get Welly Moving and to answer the questions around um, whether the airport wants more roading or whether we want to move towards less car dependence and more public transport. Um, the, the answer is we've always been supportive of Get Welly moving as a package. So it's state highway improvements and improving those choke points on the way into the airport, particularly around the basin and Mount Victoria tunnels, um, but also getting that um, mass transit system, um, hopefully to the airport um, set up. So in terms of public, the public transport side of that, um, we're really looking forward to seeing a bit more detail around those options. Um, we've seen a little bit of detail today, um, but really looking forward to the public consultation process on that. Um, we would have really loved to see a direct route to the airport retained in the package um, because we have surveyed our customers frequently on this and what they tell us is that around 60% of people would consider a direct link to the airport um, to swap out their car use for public transport um, but only about 25% would consider taking a non-direct route which sort of meanders through the eastern suburbs um, before it actually gets to the airport when people are traveling and they're in a rush um, having that 
fast and direct route is really a priority for a lot of people. Um, but regardless, you know, we've, we'll work with Get Willie moving on um, whatever the final outcome is. We've been talking to officials from Get Willie moving um, regularly as they've been considering um, this through the process. Um, we've been talking to them about um, the requirements at the airport end for a terminus or for direct, you know, for access to the um, terminal from the public transport station. Um, we already have the public transport hub, which we've invested in significantly over the last few years, um, which forms part of you know, the base of the um, car park building that we've invested in. So a huge part of, of that project and the considerations there was at the ground level, um, how we cater for um, access for public transport. So we now have that really good bus terminal coming in there. Um, and that um, that will also be able to cater to you know whatever the future of the airport bus service looks like. So we're having really good conversations with Greater Wellington just to get the details nailed around that. Um, it it really is a it's a Greater Wellington led initiative rather than um, an an airport service per se now. So probably. Um, any particular questions about the future of the bus service and where those plans are at are probably better directed to Greater Wellington rather than to us. But if there are questions about that, then I'm um, you know, happy to give you what information I have. Um, but just to just to um, wrap up and to move on to a bit of a you know conversation around um, Progress Wellington and Cobham Drive and our positioning on that. Um, but we're a part of the Progress Wellington Coalition, which is actually a group of businesses and business associations who are very interested in seeing positive movement on Get Wellington moving. It's not a negative coalition with a negative position. I think really the, the thing that unites the businesses involved in that um, is that we would love to see progress on the big rocks um, rather than um, the sort of smaller, more controversial projects um, like Cobham Drive and like the Golden Mile um, and the Hut Road and Thorndon Key changes. So I think what, what unites the businesses in that group um, is a real desire to see progress on those big rocks and particularly on you know, the future of public transport and what that's going to look like through the city. Um, so that's sort of what's you know what's driven most of us to be involved in that. Uh, but particularly from the airport side, um, our our biggest concern has been around Cobham Drive. So um, what we see as our biggest concern there really is safety, and the best safety outcome for walkers and cyclists will be an overbridge or an underbridge of some sort. So we're not saying that um, that you know we're opposed to better walking and cycling access um, from Miramar into Kilburnie and into the ASB centre. We'd just really love to see that done properly. Um, and that's a view which is shared by pretty much every business on the eastern suburbs. Um, everyone from Weta Workshops to the um, Miramar Business Association, um, Kilburnie Business Association, um, the airport, all of the taxi companies that use the airport, um, plus 83% of residents in the eastern suburbs as well, um, all agree with you know an overpass being the best solution. So that's where we're coming from on that. But happy to take any questions on any of those issues. Thank you. Um Councillor Ampoon. That's thanks. really awesome. That answers my questions about the airport flyer um, and okay. let's get really moving. So thanks, Jenna. Um, I was just wondering, okay. one other thing that I last heard was that you guys were making a decision potentially on finishing off the last section of cycleways to the airport. Is that still a thing or is that not a thing anymore? Yeah, so the, the best cycle access to the airport is still through the tunnel. Um, so... What we have been working on there um, is sort of better signposting of that route um, so that people don't come down Cobham Drive and get stuck or you know cycle through Miramar Ave, which is actually quite a dangerous stretch for cyclists. Um, so doing what we can to sort of improve accessibility and um, and sort of signage and information along that path. Um, if there is anything more that councillors think that we could do to improve that stretch of access, then you're yeah, more than happy to have further conversations on that. Jane is referring to the tunnel under the runway. Okay, thank you. Um, all right, sorry, um, Councillor Foon, um, you have a question? Yes, thanks, Jenna. Um, just, just two quick questions, if that's okay. Just what, um, thank you for that update on that cycleway, and I went and tested it after our conversation, so yeah, it does need a little bit of love on that side, um, and happy to help with that. 
but just what other initiatives is um, Wellington Airport doing to promote mode shift? And then just regarding the airport bus, um, what initiatives are you doing, are you working on to incentivise that, i.e. Um, are you planning on charging for access, that kind of thing? So it, your first question about mode shift, are you talking mostly about walking and cycling or other yeah, things? Yeah, or yeah, or electric vehicle or or yeah, pub PT. Like what's your what's your do you have a policy on that? Yeah, so we we're definitely looking into future needs for electric vehicle charging. Um but it's actually quite a um quite an interesting area because um EVs are improving so much that the range on them will be significantly increased in the next few years. So um it's more than possible that people could make the airport journey without needing to charge. Um, so it, it might not be a question of do we electrify every single car park in the um, in the multi-level car park. Um, they were, that, that building was um, created with the intention of electrification as needed in the future. Um, so we're cons considering the needs around that um, and definitely ready to invest in more electrification um, as it's needed. In terms of um, walking and cycling, like op I'm open to you know, having a conversation around any further ideas, what we could do to help incentivize that. Um, and whether that's looking again at our bike parking facilities, which we have looked at previously, um, then you're happy to hear any thoughts on improvements that can be made. And um, we can look at that, that access again through the um, underpass tunnel as well. Um, and yeah, really keen to make sure that we get that right. Um, and in terms of whether there'll be a charge for bus access, yes, it's always been our position that the costs of our provision of infrastructure need to be covered. Um, that's never been contentious in discussions with Greater Wellington, despite some of their public comments. I think in our negotiations with them, it's always, you know, they've always accepted that um, there will be an excess fee. It's it's not going to be a large fee. Um, and I think we're quite close now in the, the negotiations to agreeing what that will be. But behind the scenes, it hasn't been a contentious issue at all. Thanks, Jenna. Thank you. Um, Councillor O'Neill? Uh, thank you for that. Certainly uh, brought a bit of clarity. So um, let's get Wellington moving has the climate emergency as a core goal with 40% of a uh, goal to reduce our dependency on carbon. Um, I'm interested to know if the airport is supportive of this goal and if you still see a future for cars getting to the airport or whether you will be making strong policy decisions to reduce um, car dependency or for example, having separated cycle lanes getting to the airport? Yeah, I mean, it, there's always going to be a mix of modes. And for cars, um, I think the, the clear public policy direction um, is towards electrification rather than getting cars necessarily off the road. Um, so we'll, I mean, as I said, we'll do everything that we need to to support those electrification needs um, and to make sure that we're doing our bit there. Um, but in answer to the broader question, yes, we are supportive of carbon reduction. Yes, we're supportive of um, Get Willie Moving's goals and the city's goals. Um, and we'll do everything that we can to do our bit. Cool, thank, thank you. you. So yeah, EVs, I'm sorry, Chair, and I've just got one other question. So. I'm, I'm glad that you've brought up um, Coven Drive because we've certainly been seeing a lot of the communications out here in the community. And I take your point around wanting to focus on the big things, but I guess what's also big is a woman's died on that road from crossing. And um, the prioritization of an overhead bridge would cost 12 million more and would take significantly longer. So, um, and I take your point that your priority is safety. I'm just wanting to get a bit of clarity on whether, you know, potentially could you support um, something like a segregated zebra crossing that is significantly safer um, for community and a really good win for climate in the end, even though it's a 10 second delay for cars. So actually um, the overbridge is significantly safer as an option. That's clear in all of the analysis um, that the project team has put out. Um, in terms of the cost, that 12 million is is not really based on um, any detailed costing. So that's that's part of the submissions that we've made, um, that the alternatives to the at-grade crossing haven't really been adequately considered. Um, but 
that said, um, the, the get well moving position is basically um, that an overpass should be considered in the future anyway. So the at grade crossing for them is only a temporary solution. So our, our position on that is if you, if you want a fast solution on safety, then it would be really easy and cheap to put up a barrier in the meantime to stop people crossing at that point until um, that business case for the overbridge can be developed in the future, which it sounds like from Get Willy Moving, you know, that intention is only a couple of years away. So there are other safety solutions that are possible in the meantime. Cool. Thank you. I look forward to the alternative evidence uh, that Progress Wellington okay, has sorry, on yeah, that. Thank, thank you, Councillor O'Neill. Um, Councillor Condi? Thank you. Um, I, I was just interested again in, in your in your opposition to the, the level crossing and your support of the overbridge. The research that we have, or the evidence that we've got so far is that um, for the, every dollar that we would spend on the overbridge, we would only return 30 cents of benefit. So essentially we would be wasting 70 cents of ratepayers' money in investing in that project. And I'm just wondering, is that normally the kind of project that you would invest in in a, a Wellington International Airport? Or is it only when it's ratepayers' money that you think that's a good investment? Um, look, that all depends on the future use of the overbridge as a crossing. And part of the business case for having a crossing in the first place is that there are a number of people who um, want to use that and will use that connection in the future. Um, the, other, the other thing that you need to think about when thinking about the business case for the crossing itself is the impact on the 35,000 motorists that use that stretch of road every day. And so it's not just about the cost of the crossing and the benefit to walkers and cyclists, but the countervailing impact um, and time cost on motorists. So on both yeah, sides those, of the equation. Those cost benefit analysis include the time delays to motorists. So yes. my question to you again is, as Wellington International Airport, would you invest your own money in a project that returned 30 cents of benefit for a dollar of investment? We invest a lot of money in projects that have community good. Like we frequently do things in the terminal that don't have a commercial return because they're the right thing to do. Um, and outside of the terminal and in our community as well. So I, I think sometimes in projects like this, it's not just you know looking at the, the spreadsheets and the graphs um, and what the officials are telling you, but thinking about what the community is telling you and what is the best outcome for people. I think also I'd like to add that you can sit on the high ground here and do a, a straight business um, cost analysis on safety. We spend a lot of money on safety that has you know zero um, when it comes to returns. It's just essential and we do the job properly, it's particularly in aviation. Um, so I think um, you know building a, a crossing across Cobbin Drive is a nothing more than sticky tape. And when you consider, you know, Cobham Drive and the four lanes, the cycleway, the foot traffic is all separated. It's the gold standard of safety. And then to integrate them all again through a crossing, it just does not make sense from a safety point of view. Um, thank you. Um, I'm Deputy Mayor Free. Um, yeah, so I'm, I'm actually, I was actually a bit saddened that you did um, oppose this because I know how much the community needed it. And, 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 you know, the, I guess my question would be, do you think it's fair to ask people on foot to travel an extra one and a half, 1.1 kilometres, I think it was, um, to, to, to effectively cross that road if they had to go up to St Pat's Lights when we're asking some cars to stop a mere, what was it, 10, 15 seconds? So we're supportive of an overbridge for that reason. We are supportive of better access for people who are walking and cycling in the area. Um, in terms of the 10, 15 seconds um, and the delayed walking time, um, the information that was put out by the project team was that the average delay for pedestrians would be five minutes and for cyclists would be one minute if the status quo is retained. Um, what, and, sorry, can you just clarify that? The average delay for what? The walkers and the cyclists? The walkers and cyclists, if there is what, To try and cross that road, they yep. would just sit there and try and cross it. 
to, to go up to the was... and cycle back or to take an alternative route into Kilburnie if that was their destination? It's really hard to take an alternative route. You've got to do a quite a long day tour. It might not be such yeah. a delay for cyclists. Yeah. Yeah. But... So, we're, so we're, su we're supportive of the overpass. Um, in terms of the 10 to 15 second delay, we completely disagree that would be the scale of the delay. All of that's in our submission, um, which if you haven't read it, contains lots of technical information. We have um, transport planning experts in our team who have contributed to that. So I'll send it around to all councillors um, so that you can get a sense of the alternative perspective on that. Um, my other question though, is that we've heard from lots of the community, they don't want to climb up a bridge. Um, they do want an at-grade crossing, or if anything, they would prefer you know, to stay at grade and the road would rise up over them. A lot of people do not want to go up on a bridge and it's quite a, a disincentive. Do you have any comment to make on that? We did hear that feedback from Living Streets and from other submitters. So there are other alternatives that are possible, as you say, um, an underpass under the road or at, at grade underpass with the road going over um, or um, a crossing with a lift, which um, sounds like it would be more expensive. But if you look at overseas examples, it's not necessarily. Um, so, so there are other options. Um, but look, there's, there's no perfect option here, which is going to keep everybody absolutely happy. It's about how do you find that balance between appropriate access for walkers and cyclists while not impacting on the 35,000 motor vehicle users that are using State Highway 1 every day. Yeah. Thank you. Look, we, we need to, we do need to move on. We're not going to debate about um, it's State Highway. At the end of the day, it's State Highway um, 1. Um, and we just need to move on. Um, Councillor Panett. Thank you. Just very quickly. Um, so, yes, given your comment, Councillor Calvert, have you been talking to Waka Kotahi about this crossing? Uh, yeah, we have. Well, we've, we've been talking to the um, the Get Wellington Moving project team, um, which includes um, this representation of Waka Kotahi. Yeah. Okay, because they're the main decision makers, right. And then the other thing is, I just wanted to follow on from Councillor O'Neill's excellent question. Um, about you know how people are going to get to the airport it sounds very 90s you know to be honest this whole mix of modes we've been told now by scientists we have to slash our emissions if we're going to get to our climate goals so do you think there's any capacity for the airport to be a bit more ambitious in trying to help um, our country reach those goals yeah, I, think, I think everything that I have said is um, supportive of more and better public transport access, doing everything that we can on walking and cycling um, and on supporting electrification, which is always going to be a part of the mix. Um, you might think it's a 1990s view, but I think it's, you know, it's clearly the view coming out of the Climate Commission and um, central government that supporting electrification of the light vehicle fleet um, is a major part of the way forward. So we do have to think about that as well. Thank you. Um, now, is, does that... Um, does um, Wellington Airport, does that bring you to the end of the topics on your, on your in public? Yes, this concludes the public session and Martin okay. will cover um, the finance side, um, which is uh, public excluded. Okay, and um, before we go into that, is there any other general questions that um, anybody would like to cover off? Councillor Fitzsimons. Yeah, thanks. And look, you did briefly touch on this, but I guess I'm just interested in what you're forecasting in terms of the future of the aviation industry in a COVID world? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, it is part of um, uh, evidence in terms of the designations. Um, and, you know, we've got worldwide consultants um, who are part of um, our experts. Um, and, but, you know, on a general note, um, you know, whether it's ICAO or um, airlines and, you know, even, you know, we look at our domestic rebound when um, when COVID or when New Zealand's at level one or even level two, um, our domestic actually overshoots. Um, so, you know, there's a, a pent up frustration of people not being able to travel, um, particularly in New Zealand where air travel is almost essential. You know, we don't have the, um, the networks to actually move around the country. Um, and then you can look look abroad and see the recovery of um, aviation in the US and in Europe, where the rebound is, has been been strong. So, um, all the forecasting is in line um, with um, strong uh, rebound in aviation. 
Oh, thank you. And my second question really is um, your view on having the Wellington City Council as a shareholding partner in the airport, given its strategic significance to the airport, to the Wellington region. Sorry, Councillor Fitzsimmons, could you repeat that question? Yeah, sure. My other question was really about your view, if any, about having the Wellington City Council as a shareholder in the airport, given its strategic significance to the Wellington region? I think that is a shareholder question. I don't think I can really have a view on that. Um, I think you need to talk to Impetil, um, your uh, shareholder partner. Cool. Thanks. Appreciate your time here today. Um, Councillor Roche. Yeah, um, a slightly curly one for you, Steve, but, uh, but possibly uh, a little bit um, uh, less dramatic, should we say. So um, we're um, building a new park next to your retail uh, centre to the west of um, the airport called Hutapara Park. Um, and one of the issues there is the, uh, the need for a public loo. And I understand that the retail park, part of the deal was that a public lavatory would be made available, but it's hidden in a cafe. So would the airport be open to a conversation around helping us out with the, uh, the new park and, and the, uh, the need for a public lavatory there, which would service the retail park as well in a public fashion? Um, yeah, uh, Councillor Rush, you're right. It is a curly question. Um, I don't have I don't have any information on that, but I'm happy to um, talk to you offline about that and, and uh, yeah. talk to my retail manager. Good as gold. Thanks, Steve. Thank you. Um, Councillor Young. So, as we seem to be going all over the place, I'll, I have two questions um, which are not connected to each other. So, the first of all is about the the road that goes is it um, Duff Dash Drive or whatever it's called. Um, that goes through the airport on, on airport land. So I know that people use it to access the South Coast and vice versa, but how, many, how often do you get people towing boats through? And I'm thinking really going uh, from Lyle Bay, you know, towards to north when they have to go through the, um, the airport, is it departures or arrivals, you know, when they have to go up the ramp. I'm just wondering about that from a health and safety perspective. Yeah, thanks, Councillor Young. Um, yeah, we do. I mean, there's no doubt about it. the access from the south and the north and the amount of traffic that goes through. It's a rat run. Um, mm. you know, it's a stretch to call it a road. You're actually driving through car park, car park access. Um, and um, particularly from the south, if you're going to access the north as a th thoroughfare, um, you do go either through the pickup or the drop off zone. Um, so it's not a road. Um, and uh, yes, there are bus, uh, uh, particularly on weekends, people towing boats through, and it is a health and safety concern. It's something we're watching very carefully, and that's why we encourage councillors to consider the lot lot one land on the eastern side that we own, and um, our, you know our offer to divest um, some land on that far eastern side for councils to build a road, which would be a much safer option. And and um, so I, I don't really. No, what's the council's temperature on that suggestion? Um, I'm not sure where the council has fully considered it. I think the first thing is um, once we have our designation on the eastern side, um, then um, we can certainly talk about the uh, the buffer area between um, those uh, the eastern side houses, like on Bunker Way, and um, you know the green the green zone that we're um, promising to put there, and also um, a road should go around there as well. Okay, thank you. So then I, I have another question, which is totally unconnected. Um, putting aside my longing to get on a plane and go to London to see my three-year-old grandson, um, just wondering about um, the future of the airport financially, because of course we um, are shareholders. What do you think the chances are of council needing to stump up considerable funds or even inconsiderable funds um, uh, for the equity of it, you know, putting in more equity? Um, so, I think Martin's going to cover that in the, yeah, in the finance section and um, okay. we'd rather take that offline. Yeah. yeah. Sure, sure, sure. Okay, thank you. That's that's it from me. Okay, thank you. Um, all right, well, we um, need to go into um, public excluded now. Now, um, Heidi, um, I wonder if you just give me some advice because I'm not quite clear from the notes. Are you online? Um, yes, I am. So we will need to vote to go into public excluded. Um, and you've suggested that we do all of the public excluded items in this session. So um, I'll just share my screen so that you can see the wording of the motion. 
Um, hopefully you can see that now. So we go into public excluded to um, receive the briefing from the international airport. And um, we can't um, see anything at the moment. Okay. Hmm. Um, um, excuse me now. Um, Madam Chair, would we be able to have a morning tea break? We've yeah, break I just I just wonder whether we I just wonder whether Normally we, we do. Get, yes, okay. no, I, I I appreciate that. Thank you. Um, but I just want to be clear, quite clear what we're doing about public excluded first. And what I'm going to suggest is that we just get this sorted out now. Um, we have an adjournment because I actually might have an amendment to the public excluded motion. Yeah, I've got um, a little bit of questions too. I, I'm really not comfortable with us doing this. But um, okay, well, all right then. Well, we will take a um, morning tea break now. Um, Councillor Conley, if you've got a, poten a potential amendment, mm -hmm. it would have been good to have raised that a bit sooner. But anyway, um, if you could get that out and um, we will take a break for um, 15 minutes back at um, 5 to 11. Thank you. Um, um, Wellington Airport, are you all right for that? Um, I do have a... Um, another engagement at 11 which i have to go to but martin is more than capable to answer any questions okay thank um thank you for that thank you. um it will probably be by the time we come back um, and then go through whatever debate we are going into for um public excluded it, it may even be a bit longer before we actually get to your briefing okay just to give you a heads up all right thanks thanks diane thank you. okay thank you
Oh, have we started the meeting again? Uh, the adjournment was until 10.55, so just waiting for people to turn their cameras okay, on. Okay, that's all right. I was nervous about missing it. <laughs> Thank you, Heidi. I have to say, I think you do an amazing job, by the way. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. Absolutely unflappable. <laughs> I'm having you on my side when there's a crisis. <laughs> right, welcome back, everyone. Now, I think, um, as I said, we're about to go into public excluded. Heidi, I think you have some advice, or was it from Sarah Hay? Uh, so my understanding is that we will be going into public excluded now just for the public excluded briefing from Wellington International Airport and also to discuss the attachments to item 3.1, the annual report. Um, and then we will return to a public session and later on go into a public excluded, well, vote to go into a public excluded session for the balance sheet. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So... Um, Just trying to get my notes. So we, um, so um, Heidi, can you put up the um, recommendation? Hopefully, you can see that now. Yeah. Okay. Diane, I'm happy to second this. Okay. All right. So, um, and I'm just getting to the um, right page. Even though some of the stuff is changing at the last minute. Not, not, I believe the mayor is going to join us just for this bit. So who is? Uh, Andy. Oh, yeah. Okay. All right. So, um, look, everybody can see the the, um, the recommendation in front of us about but going to public excluded. Now we're dealing with... Just accidentally. Sorry, I just I just muted myself by accident. Sorry, um, and um, yeah. So look, you can see the um, the recommendation on the screen, um, and this gives officers a bit more time to deal with sort of um, last minute um, proposals going forward. Um, so um, we've got the brief. We've got the um, public through the briefing, which is focusing on the um, the commercial aspects, financial aspects. And then we're going to deal with the attachments to the audit and risk subcommittee um, meeting, um, which um, are, is confidential. So, um, and Deputy Mayor Frey, you have agreed to, to second um, the motion. Um, I don't think, I think it's all pretty explanatory. We also will agree that, um, that Wellington Airport will remain for the part of their, obviously their briefing. And then uh, Karen Young will um, audit New Zealand will also um, be remaining because in, in respect of the um, preliminary audit report. So Andy's, um, um, can I just, sorry to interrupt, but Andy's yeah. just um, texted to say his mic and his video are blocked. Oh. So he may text a vote through. He is able to see the meeting, but not able at the minute to vote. Okay, all right. So is there any debate? Um, see anyone who hands up? Um, okay, so look, we will. Um, um, I'll not now put forward the motion, um, which has been moved and seconded. Um, would those in favour please um, um, click green if against, click red. I tried to tick green. Okay. <laughs> Technology is a wonderful thing. Uh, just waiting on, oh, never mind. Uh, so we've got 11 votes in favour and three votes against. Those against being Councillor Pennett, Councillor Paul and Councillor O'Neill. Um, Deputy Mayor, have you had a text vote from Mayor Foster? Uh, no, I imagined he was going to vote, uh, text it into you, but if it's, it doesn't, it's not too crucial, so. Um. Um, well, regardless of the way that Mayor Foster would vote, um, that motion has carried. 
Thank you. Um, if you give us a couple of minutes just to turn the live stream off. Yep, certainly. Diane. So what yeah. are we doing now? We're going to. So we're coming in. We're, we're now back. We'll be back. Oh, we'll hang start on, again live. in public. Yeah. And now we're going to debate the balance sheet review paper in terms of it going into public excluded. Okay. Can't buy. It seems to have fixed it, hopefully. I'm sorry, I think a couple of people tried to ring me, but I was just on the phone before, so I couldn't take um, a number of calls. I was just going to suggest a course forward, Diane, which I'm happy to discuss with you on the yeah. phone. We're not online, are we? Oh. <laughs> How about you yeah, do that? Right. That would be quite yeah, maybe yeah, it would be really all the time. Yeah, shall I just give you a quick call, Diane? Yeah, okay. Um, so, hey, do we okay? All right. So, I think we're ba we're back. Are we back on line? We are live. Thank you, and um, welcome, everyone. We're now back to um um to the next paper, which is where we will discuss um, going into public excluded for the balance sheet review investments paper. Um, would officers um, have any comment about this or do we go straight, Heidi, do we go straight into the um, um, debate? Uh, so um, the motion can be moved yeah. um, if officers would like to introduce the public, ex like just, would, it would like to speak to the reasons why it's recommended that it's public excluded, then that could happen okay. now as well. Okay, all right. So can I ask officers just to talk, um, just to speak briefly about why this paper should be in public excluded? Go to councillors. Can you hear me? I'm not. There we go, good. Um, so the, we've sent out some advice around um, whether this paper should be in public or public excluded. Um, it does make um, the advice difficult when we're in public um, for a wholesome debate to be held when you're um, excluding parts of that debate. So um, we will, we've will we provided the advice and um, happy to take any questions that you might have on the advice. Thank you. Um, Councillor for Simons. Yeah, so, so thank you for circulating the redacted paper, which I understand to deal with the aspects of it that you consider as commercially sensitive. Given there is a strong public interest in other aspects of the paper, can you confirm that the redacted paper could be released consistently with the Act and that we could have at least part of the discussion in public? Beth, are you online? Should have given her a little nudge. Um, so you, our, pre, our advice is that the whole debate should be in PX, but if um, you resolve to hold the debate in public, um, that redacted version could be released. Thank you. Thank you. 
Any other questions of officers? Okay, so look, I'll move the motion that um, the public is excluded from the following part of the proceedings of this meeting. Um, um, and that pursuant to the provisions of the Local Government Official Information and Meetings Act, exclude the public from the following part of the proceedings of this meeting, namely the balance sheet review, um, the reasons being under section 72B, um, subsection two, and the grounds being under section 48, subsection 1A. Um, is, um, could I have a seconder, please? Thank you, Councillor Young. I would just speak very briefly to this. Um, um, having any debate in part of this type of paper um, in public would mean that there's, um, it, would be, it would be incomplete in, in terms of retaining some of the information and not, and, and not being able to talk freely. Um, so I believe that this is the best course of action to proceed with. Um, it is of a, a commercial nature. Um, and so we actually um, owe it to um, Wellingtonians to make sure that we preserve um, our commercial position on this. Um, um, Councillor Young, would you like to speak? Not at the moment. Thank you. Um, Councillor for Simons. Yeah, I'm, I'm strongly opposed to us having this discussion in public excluded. We are discussing something as critical to Wellingtonians as asset sales. There is no reason why this should be done in public excluded. There is massive public interest in public ownership of our assets. And I strongly urge people of all of the votes that we've ever had on whether to go into public excluded, this is the easiest one to vote against. We have a redacted paper ready to go. And if there are aspects in the redactions that councillors wish to discuss in private, they can do so. We can resolve to have some of the discussion in public excluded, which is absolutely standard practice for public authorities when aspects of a decision can be public and aspects of a decision need to be public excluded. And I'm sorry, but the relationship with the airport is not a valid consideration under the Act about whether the public are excluded from a Wellington City Council meeting. Um, I'm not sure whether you should have mentioned that part of what um, Councillor for Simons, but anyway, you have. Um, Councillor Condon. Thank you. Um, yeah, I mean, I absolutely acknowledge that there is some information in the report that is commercially sensitive and that needs to be withheld under the Act. Um, but I also think that for the, for the most part, actually, the debate that we need to have will not actually touch on that information. I don't think that that's actually where the conversation is going to go. Um, so I think that the bulk of the conversation, the bulk of the paper can clearly be, be shared publicly according to officers. And I actually think by far the bulk of the conversation absolutely can be um, carried out in public without disclosing any of that commercially sensitive information. Um, we've proven in the past that we are able to hold conversations in public carefully in, in such a way that we protect information that doesn't need to be disclosed. Um, so I think in this case, while I do regret that this is all happening on quite short notice because it's been a difficult week and it would have been better if we'd had this organized uh, well in advance um, and particularly you know, to coordinate with external parties. Um, I do thank staff for kind of their quick response this morning. And I do, I campaign strongly on doing as much and open and transparently as possible. And I do think that issues that have such high public interest should be debated in public as much as they can be, which is, I think, what we're trying to, to arrange here is acknowledging that there is some areas that are commercially sensitive um, and that those need to be respected, but that for, for the most part, we can have this debate in public. So I will be voting against going into public excluded this morning. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Councillor Pennett. Um, we can't hear you. Sorry, thank you, Councillor Calvert. Um, look, obviously I've um, been very consistent on this point and, and voted against practically everything <laughs> into public excluded. So I will be consistent on this point um, and, and vote against going in. But I just wanted to make two points. One is that um, I don't think anyone should be condemned for voting to go into PE. I mean, I can understand the rationale given it's a, a strategic asset. And the other point is that I really just want to again, reflect on the importance of maybe separating out our papers so that, you know, 
most papers are in public and then just put the commercial stuff in a separate bit, just as a matter of practice, uh, given this council's made a, a, a strong commitment to um, trying to be even more transparent. But I uh, do appreciate the chance to have this discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Panis. Are there any other speakers? Um, Councillor Roche. Yeah, hi, colleagues. I mean, we are, a, as a public organisation, we have, do have different duties and obligations. But, you know, this is a strategy about rationalising our portfolio. And I, I can't help but think that you would absolutely not want the public uh, and competitors um, and, and possible buyers or sellers to really be tipped off as to what you're doing and thinking. And, um, you know, I, I, I do think that, uh, uh, I mean, we've received a redacted version of this paper at just before midday. I haven't read it. I don't, I don't know what's being redacted. I, I think, though, that you know, final decisions that come out obviously will need to be public. Um, and there is an opportunity there to maybe explain reasoning. But I do think that if we're going to have a free and frank conversation about the, the asset portfolio and the strategy, particularly the strategy, you don't want uh, everyone to know about, um, at least until you execute. So I'll be supporting going into PE. Um, thank you, Councillor Rush. Councillor O'Neill? Thank you. Just briefly, we are a public institution. This is something that has had a very high public interest over many years, and I don't think that it is appropriate to be holding these discussions behind closed doors in particular if we decide to make, um, it, regardless of the decision that we make in the next debate, will be controversial, will leave our community with a lot of questions. And I think we would do ourselves a good favour to try and keep as transparent as possible, particularly things such as asset sales. Thank you. Um, any other speakers? Okay, I'll do the um, quick right of reply. Um, um, for those, you will know that we have a significance and an engagement policy um, that governs how and, and directs how we um, engage on significant um, and strategic assets. Um, there's no um, suggestion that this will not apply. This is just this part of the um, decision or the debate is leading up to that. So any sale or change or whatever, any um, strategic assets of the city um, will go through that process. So suggesting that it um, won't is, um, um, is probably being a bit on the mischievous side. So, um, and we also run the risk of not having a cohesive discussion with parts redacted. And even now we've had, even in part of this debate, we've had some um, comments made um, and references that shouldn't have been made. Um, and that's the difficulty it is when you're trying to swap between the two. So um, I will be supporting that we go into um, public excluded. This is important. And I also um, call, um, suggest that everyone needs to abide by the, um, this um, decision as well. So look, I'll quickly move this to the vote. Um, Can we get a division? Yep, absolutely. Um, we'll move this to the vote now. You know which buttons to press accordingly. So. <laughs> so can we just, for the sake of clarification and consistency, have the motion in front of us that we're voting on? Yeah. So if you wish, um, if you agree for this to go into public excluded as officers have recommended, um, then um, click green. If you disagree, click red. Okay, so um, that has 
failed, seven votes in favour, eight votes against. The votes in favour were Councillor Calvert, Deputy Mayor Free, Councillor Foon, Councillor Rush, Councillor Wolf, Liz Kelly and Mayor Foster. Thank you. All right, so we will now adjourn for lunch and then we will come back and, um, and complete the meeting. Um, so it's 12.44, so I suggest a, is everybody comfortable with a half hour break? Can we, can we have, sorry? Can we, can we have 45 minutes? Uh, that yeah. would be super helpful, it's been okay. a hard week. Okay, all right, um, 1.30. Do you have any idea when you think the meeting might end? Tomorrow. Um, well, yeah, I mean, I think we've, you, you've just probably extended it somewhat, but that's fine. Mm, I'd just love to go for a walk, see what, what yeah. it's like on the outside. Well, well, yeah, okay, 45 minutes. Okay, thank you. See you, bye. You need to be careful around talking specific numbers and stuff. Very, very careful about... Um, about questions, very careful about statements, very careful about ref referring to information that might be redacted. Hey, Sean, yep. can, you, can you send me um, the, the redacted, redacted sure. um, email that you, that you got? Can you, can you send it though to, um, to I'll, I'll, I'll text you the email. Because I think okay. we're now. Yep. Awesome. Thank you. Um, let's see. Oh, hang on. Better turn that off, eh? Um, Heidi, have we got a quorum? Um, not that I can, oh, yes, now we do. Okay. So I'm just trying to find the redacted paper. Is it in our emails? Yep. Which one is it? One from uh, Sarah Hay at 11.57 a.m. And at what time? No, this 11.57 a.m. Oh, okay. Thank you. I mean, really, shouldn't we all be familiar with what's been redacted and therefore shouldn't be discussed? I mean, not, not a criticism of you, Councillor Young, at all, but I mean, I haven't read the whole thing either. Fortunately, I didn't write a speech. <laughs> um, Heidi, just in terms of order of papers now, um, what, um, and I'm conscious that some people might want to flick through the redacted version of the um, balance sheet review paper. Um, shall we, I just wonder whether we should do some of those other papers, um, or is that too much confusion? Just tell me what you think is the best way. Um, that's at your discretion, Councillor Calvert. As the chair, you can accord precedence to any items on the agenda, um, and that that's only um, up for a challenge if any councillor disagrees. So it's really at your discretion. Right. Okay. So, um, so I'm just pr I'm just actually printing. You probably hear in the background. I'm just actually printing that document out. So I've got a hard uh, copy. Yeah. Yeah. Too many screens just, going. I just wonder if people are trying to read it, if it's a bit hard for them to be debating other papers, um, would be my yeah, Okay, look, I'm, we're going to go straight. Well, I, what I'm going to do, Heidi, can we just adjourn for 10 minutes so people can read that um, redacted version? Yes, that's no problem. We can adjourn now. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I think so I and the key bit is people stay away from numbers. Yeah, I think that's the key bit. But look, I will give people the option. Um, just, I, I, I just want to make sure that we're all quite clear about what we can and can't do or say, um, and that you're au okay fait with what's been redacted in the paper. 
So if I, is a five or 10 minute break suitable for everyone? Are we, or does anybody yeah. disagree? Five is fine, I'm sure. Five, okay, so we'll, we'll resume back at, at um, 1.40. Thank you. You must be hazy. <laughs> okay.
Thank you. Um, I take it everyone's had sufficient time to just make themselves familiar with the, um, the paper and the redactions. Okay. All right, so um, um, Heidi will just confirm the um, um, discussion, um, the order of papers now. We will do the um, balance sheet review. Um, we will then go to the, um, 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 the audit and risk. Um, then we'll go into development contributions. And then we will do the um, actions and, and forward papers. Are you comfortable with that in terms of how things will work? Yes, that's fine. Thank you. All right. Okay, thank you. Welcome back, everyone. And um, we are now in public, and we will be looking at um, 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 the next paper is the balance um, sheet review. Um, and I invite officers to um, um, introduce, um, I will introduce this paper. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, so today we'll be considering options to reduce our currently concentrated risk of our investment portfolio. Not only are we presenting a pathway to reduce that significant risk, but also to reinvest in a portfolio that will move us from what I would classify as passive investment to more impactful investing. Um, and, and what that means is that we could potentially be generating revenues while also supporting the delivery of some of our strategic objectives, such as climate change and investment in social infrastructure. We have an opportunity to free up um, our balance sheet through this process. We currently, as you know, through the long-term plan discussions, we currently hold a significant amount of headroom for the unforeseen events. So 272 million is the value of our um, either uninsured assets that have either been either uneconomical or unable to be insured. And by investing um, any proceeds into a much more liquid portfolio, we would be able to free up that part of our balance sheet to invest in critical infrastructure requirements. It's important to note um, what you are being asked to resolve today versus what you're not being asked to resolve. So we're seeking your approval to come back with a statement of proposal for your decision, uh, for you to decide to consult with Wellingtonians on on that basis. So at this stage, it's important um, that you keep an open mind in the discussion and not close off any of the options. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions that uh, councillors may have. Okay, any questions? Councillor Rush. Thanks. Um, thank you very much, uh, Sarah. So is this a standard sort of review? Does this, this sort of thing happen with Wellington or councils routinely, or is this an unusual thing because of unusual times? Um, thank you, Councillor Rush. This is um, a usual thing to do. In fact, it's a requirement under Section 14 of the Local Government Act uh, for a local authority to ensure prudent stewardship and the efficient and effective use of its resources. Um, this is just um, appropriate for, for me to bring to you a view of your current portfolio and the risks embedded in it and some options for how you might want to resolve those. Okay. Councillor Rush, I, I would also add um, in terms of um, is this usual, um, I have personally been involved in several um, balance sheet reviews in my time a, as a chief executive in the local government sector. Thanks. Thank you. Um, Councillor Young? So um, I'm just concerned about a potential conflict of interest between the mayor, who is a director of uh, the airport, and of course he's our mayor. And uh, I just don't think, I'm not a lawyer, but I know a little bit about conflict of interest just recently. And um, so I just think that it's not right that he should be here in this discussion with votes when he's also a director of the airport. Thank you, Councillor Young. Um, I know Beth is in a, in a taxi on the way to the airport, but are you um, able to talk, Beth? 
Yes, kia ora, councillors, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Okay. I feel it. Uh, um, yes. Um, look, uh, Councillor Young, we've looked at that issue specifically for today's um, question, and um, our view is that there is no conflict that exists that would prevent the Mayor from um, taking part in discussions or voting on today's issue. We are going to look specifically at um, the more... Uh, the uh, real issue if things if things develop um, as proposed um, and provide some specific and uh, robust advice to the mayor in relation to that as um, in the future. So, so two other questions. So one is, um, did you get any external advice on this? Oh. No, we didn't, councillor. Just, just interested. Uh, and then the second one is, um, oh, it's gone out of my mind. Oh, yes. So knowing that they have a lot of board meetings, so you know um, the mayor is on both sides of the thing. So how many of the board meetings has he been to, and has he been there? Does he ever recuse himself from board? Um, um, it's Councillor Young. I understand where that's going, but I think that's out of that's out of scope of this paper. Mm, I just think it's relevant for how much he is on top of the subject. That's really um, right. Yeah, yeah. Look, I, but I think it's out, outside of the scope of this paper, so I will. Um, You're the chair. I'll, You're the chair. Well, our office is to address that. Um, and just so you know, I also sought advice from officers about whether the mayor would, would potentially have a conflict, and um, and I I know they've also given advice to the mayor on it as well, and um, they've satisfied me that he doesn't um, at this stage. So thank you, um, Councillor yeah. Condy. Thank you, Chair. I'm going to start with a couple of questions, Sarah, about the proposal for the new investment portfolio and what we might look at doing for that. Um, First of all, the proposal suggests that we look at investing in areas that are more growth focused, so focused on reinvestment rather than focused on delivering dividends. And so my question is that at the moment we use these investments to offset rates and how will we use the, the future investments to offset rates if they're not dividend focused or is that no longer going to be one of the objectives for this investment portfolio? Thank you, Councillor Condi. So the um, intention is that we retain the same level of dividend return from the new portfolio in its totality. Um, however, um, that might be achieved, in so, so that will be a that will be a combination of growth and returns annually. Um, so it's, it may not have come through in the paper, but that would be the intention. So still, still offset rates to a degree. Okay, thank you. So it's kind of a mixed objective then. Yes. Um, thank you. And then my other question is that um, obviously council, council has a long time horizon for investment, um, but also, but these growth portfolios tend to have potentially higher risk as well as long time horizons, whereas in council, we tend to be a very low risk environment. And I know that other councils have these kinds of portfolios of investments. How do they manage when if there's a short-term downturn and, and suddenly you've got short-term losses in that portfolio, how does that go? Mm. So the intention would be, Councillor Condi, to, in a high growth year, ring fence any um, returns that were over forecasts and ensure that those were used to offset years where returns were lower than expected. Um, as, we do, as we do now, um, if there is a, a shock that causes us to lose revenue, it may be an, an option to, to debt fund that in a short term if we don't have the ring fence funds built up at an appropriate level, um, but those would be decisions that council would make as and when required. Thanks, I have a few minor questions on ground leases, but I'll let someone else go first and come back on later. Yeah. Um, thank you very much, Sarah. I think this is a very useful paper to have. Um, so, do you know how much power co was sold for? Um, like, so, I was just curious how much you increased in that. I might remember. I'm not, I'm not sure. No, I don't have that information to hand. Sorry, Councillor Hannah. Okay, so it's just really about are investments growing in value when they are sold? I guess was kind of the question because I just wanted to see what it originally been um, yeah, flipped up for. Um, and the market for, uh, for airports at the moment, how's it looking? So Councillor Panna, um, without talking too much about the buyer universe, um, uh, the, 
the market for infrastructure investors to put their money um, anywhere is good. Um, yeah, it's a, I wouldn't be recommending this if I didn't think it would be a valuable time to do it. Right. And just the other question I've got is, so if we were to sell it and the investments were to be managed at arm's length, would it kind of be a bit like the arrangement we've got with the local government funding agency where we've kind of got some input but not a lot? Um, through like a CCO um, or? Yes, so, so the likely, um, with LGFA we share the direction and those establishment founding documents with a number of other shareholding councils and so our, our input and control is diluted in that way. You, you would be the only council setting up that statement of investment priority and, and from the outset. So, so what you want to achieve as an objective out of that fund would be set by you and, and no other councils would be the main difference. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Liz Kelly. Oh, kia ora. Um, I'm sorry, I just wanted to go back to the question that was raised by Councillor um, Nicola. And, and just when she was asking for um, conflict of interest with the mayor, can you confirm for me, um, is the mayor's role on the airport committee or on the airport board, is that a council appointment? Yes, council, oh, sorry, Liz Kelly. Um, it is, we have two board appointments to the airport board. Um, one, is, one is the mayor and the other one is Wayne, Wayne Eagleson. Okay, yeah, okay, thank you. Well, that's self-explanatory then, that there wouldn't be um, a conflict, I would have thought. And also just confirming um, the other question that was asked around, um, do we plan for, you know, a loss of dividends? Um, can you confirm that we use um, good practice business models where there always is a contingency plan in place? Yes, I can confirm. Okay, so so I guess though um, uh, a pandemic like we've had to um, be involved in for the last 18 months is probably a contingency plan that nobody would have foresaw seen. Yeah, no, that's a um, that's a really good example to to articulate one of the drivers for diversifying our current portfolio. Um, the current portfolio is exposed to the performance of Wellington CBD um, and, and therefore all of you know, our investments potentially um, could be impacted by the same event. A, a diversified portfolio would provide that level of risk mitigation. Um, yeah, mitigate the risk. Yeah, yeah. And I suppose, though, I mean, to be fair, we're hearing daily uh, of... Um, uh, small businesses that are really struggling. So I, I guess it's it's not surprising that uh, we would be, we would have losses as well. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, um, Councillor Day. Kia ora, thank you. Um, my question is just around. Obviously, this is um, well, whilst it's a Wellington City Council-owned um, shareholding, uh, this is a regional. Um, facility and I'm just wondering what conversations have happened um, with regional mayors um, and and with mana whenua and also um, any you know sort of government um, connections that we need to be thinking about with this sort of it is it is a, um, a decision that has wider impacts than just our city have, have there been any conversations yet? Thanks Councillor Day we thought it was appropriate to have the conversation with our council first um, and then absolutely we, we can engage broadly and, and, and council can have um, that sort of discretion when you set the consultation approach, how we, how we go about and who we consult with. Thank you. Okay. Um, Councillor Simons. Yeah, um, I've got a few questions. The, um, when we were all first elected, to the council, Andy took us into his office and went through a whole series of things and asked us our position on them. And my understanding was that he didn't get much support for possible sale of the airport. So I'm just wondering, is this an officer-led initiative at this time? Councillor Fitzsimons, um, yes, this is an office-led office, office 
officer-led um, proposal to you at this stage? And in 1998, when officers proposed um, sale of the airport in, at that time, they said that it should take, that the advice was that it should take place separately from an annual plan process and then it needed its own process. Why are officers not suggesting that this time? So I'm not, um, I was seven in 1998 and um, I'm not sure what was the driving force then, but we are proposing a special consultative procedure and a an, and an long-term plan amendment. So if this was just a normal annual plan process, you're not required to consult um, or have the level of audit that you would in a long-term plan amendment or, and an SCP. So that is, what we are, that is what we're recommending. And can I just add as well, um their councillor that and uh, the local government act as we said now is uh, came in in 2002 so these and we are following the requirements of the local government act so it, they may not have been in place in 1998 i'm not sure i couldn't i couldn't speak to um, 1998 can speak to the 2002 act well i can say i wasn't seven in 1998 oh, 90, I, thought you said 88. I was not seven 17 <laughs> <laughs> Sarah, okay. Yeah, but in 1998, uh, you're, you're, you're correct. So, some of the requirements of councils were not that we are now obliged to comply with were not in place then. So this um, this airport and its sale has had a very fraught history. In fact, people have written histories of the story of the sale or the attempted sale of this airport. Have officers looked into that history? Have you read the last paper that officers put forward around sale of the airport? What kind of background work's been done at looking at this prior to this paper being brought to us? Um, Councillor Fitzsimons, we have done a significant amount of work since about August last year, um, doing bringing this um, paper together. I suppose what I what I would point your attention to is that this paper isn't necessarily about the sale of the airport. Uh, it's not an airport issue in its own right. It's more around the risks of, a, of our current investment portfolio as it stands, um, being the ground lease portfolio and the airport. And, and the intent of the paper is around diversifying that risk rather than um, the focus on just the airport. Mm. It's also um, in the context of today's environment, which is um, different from any we have experienced in the past. So just trying to reconcile that comment with the comment earlier that this is not really a COVID-related issue. If COVID hadn't occurred, would officers be bringing us a proposal today to consult on sale of the airport? Councillor for Simons, we would still have undertaken a review of the balance sheet. Hmm. But that wasn't my question. It was about whether you would have still brought the proposal to consult on sale of the airport today. I think that's probably speculation, Councillor mm -hmm. Fitzsimons. I, I, I think the point the CFO is making is this, this is a consequence of a review of the overall balance sheet, not simply an airport matter. And can I just um, also test with you, if um, a global, um, an, an international investor were interested, they would have to have overseas investment office approval, wouldn't they? Have you, which is the paper notes. Have you done any thought about the likelihood of that approval being gained? Thought, yes, but also um, it's not just the OIA that we would need approval from, but also this council on who we sell the airport to. And just finally, um, just checking that in terms of the proposed time frame, say we agreed today to consult on possible sale of the airport, you then prepared the documents, we then consulted at the same time as the annual plan, we then sold it. It wouldn't be up to this council to make the decisions about how those proceeds are spent. It's most likely to be up to the next council given the election cycle, isn't it? So this council could decide on the proceeds strategy in isolation of an airport sale decision um, because that's a clarification of the current financial strategy that we're asking you to, to, to make. Um, when we bring the next paper back, if we bring the next paper back, that's when we'll be clarifying the process and the timeframes for you. But this paper says it will be at the same time as the annual plan. We're just thinking about timing and when the election is and how long these things take to transact. It won't be this council making the decision. We can send a message, but the proceeds will be for the, if, it, if the sale went through. 
the proceeds and the investment strategy for that would be up to the next council, wouldn't it? There is an opportunity that this council could resolve pending any future sale and purchase agreement, for example, what the potential prices that you would expect to receive and what you would want to do with those proceeds. This council could do that. Sorry, Councillor Fitzsimons, you just went a bit quiet. Oh, I'm just I'm just checking it, that, that you expect that, that any such decision wouldn't be binding on a council elected at the next election. Councillor Fitzsimons, we could probably say uh, that um, uh, about any council, uh, each triennium, a council um, makes decisions and these decisions over time can be reviewed. But I have been involved in processes like this before where uh, the existing council can put in place a strong framework and legal obligations that um, councils that come after them must comply with. So just to clarify then finally, are you saying that we could find another council about how they spend the proceeds of an airport sale or not? And if so, what, what are these other processes you're involved in that, that, that were that provided for that? I'm not sure I quite heard your question, Councillor Fitzsimons. Sorry, I, I mean, yeah, like, like you just said that you can set in place a framework and that you've been involved in other processes yeah. instead of place yeah. a framework. So let's use an example. Say... The, the next elected council wants to use all of the proceeds to pay down debt. Now, that's not the proposal in this paper, but say they wanted to. They are free to do that, aren't they? I think any major, um, any decision of significance, the council of the day must comply with the same um, legal requirements as you do now, um, and that would involve um, a, a completely new consultation process. So there are checks and balances um, for any council and the way it must make major decisions on behalf of the city. Thanks. Okay, thank you. Um, Councillor Foon. Um, thanks all for the mahi on this. Um, so as, as we heard this morning, um, this is just around infrastructure and investment. So we've got an investment and this is a city... So we've got the infrastructure that is requiring an upgrade, so around the seawall, and which is 70 million. I guess so. The question is, what are are there any other infrastructure um, investments expected in the next 10 to 20 years? And and I guess the biggest investment is if we uh, if the airport want to extend, what's our involvement in terms of investing in that extension? And if we don't invest, what is the opportunity um, for the airport to seek other investment? So really, it's about what, what binding have we got around being a shareholder and an investor, as well as um, what freedoms uh, Wellington Airport have to seek other investment. Thanks, Councillor Foon. Um, the airport has many freedoms to seek investment from many places if they sought um, an investment from their shareholders, um, however, and council did not participate in that um, process, and yet the other shareholder did, um, you could find yourself in a position where your shareholding is worth less um, tomorrow than it is today if you haven't participated and the other shareholdings is worth more. So, so just to confirm, um, uh, with the extend extension this morning, you know, which we've just heard, it is likely that that the airport will continue to um, proceed or want to proceed with that extension. Does the council have any ability to limit that extension through our shareholding? Not currently, as we only have two board appointments. We don't have the um, majority on the board to influence any major decision like that. Um, we have a regulatory role that we can absolutely play, um, whether we are a shareholder or not. We have a relationship influence role that we can play, and I'm sure you would exercise that as well. Um, but the reality is we do not have... Um, we do not have control of the airport um, by any way, shape or form with our current shareholding. Okay, thank you. Thank you. I'm Councillor Roche. 
Thanks. I'm, I'm interested, um, and you didn't actually answer Laurie's second question uh, Sorry, Laurie. about future infrastructure investments. And I guess that's where I was going because we talk about reinvestment. I, I get a sense that you're, it seems like you're thinking of plowing the money into a sort of low risk hedge fund or something like that. Whereas I'm sort of more minded of, you know, a, a wind farm, for example, or some sort of low carbon stuff that you know, the private sector don't want to do because of the carbon price as it is. Can you just maybe, what options are, are you not thinking of or are all options on the table, including the wind farm? So Councillor Rush, um, the recommendation is absolutely that we move to an impactful investment approach. So the proceeds would be going into, yes, for example, wind farms, but think, but investments that could also help us deliver on our strategic objectives, whether that be climate change, whether that be investment in social infrastructure like housing, affordable housing. So um, yes, less of ploughing into a low-risk hedge fund, more of being impactful around the outcomes we want to achieve through our investment. Okay, so, and just that leads me to, I suppose, I think Councillor Fitzsimons touched on this. Um, you know, it's nice to get a, a, a dividend um, every year, um, but when you invest in these sort of newer projects or more social, I suppose, public service type of projects, light cycle ways, we don't get that um, dividend. And I, I guess uh, just my question to you is, is, is our officers comfortable with that? Thanks, Councillor Rush. Um, the key here is diversified, um, and so we would be looking at multiple investments, but also we've done the analysis um, that shows that uh, ESG or corporate responsibility green investment fund can deliver the same returns that we've seen across our portfolio in the past. Okay, thank you. And Councillor Condon? Thank you. I've just got a couple of questions about the ground lease portfolio. Um, my first one was that out of that, there was a number of options that, that officers considered for the future of the ground, use, ground lease portfolio. And one of them was that we securitize the portfolio. Um, and while it's not recommended, I, I have to admit, I only have a vague understanding of what securitizing the portfolio might mean. Can you expand on that for me, please? Sure, Councillor Condi. So the, the concept is you wrap the portfolio up in a bow, you, you sell the proceeds of the portfolio to an investor who would give you an upfront lump sum of money. Um, say an ACC want to give you X whatever million for that, but you receive, but what they're buying is that revenue stream. They're buying the annual returns and you're getting a one-off lump sum payment. Um, you don't sell the asset. Um, you get the best returns from a securitised approach like that is if you guarantee the revenue stream, so you're wearing a bit of risk. Um, yeah, and, and yeah, that's not a, a recommended option. Um, I also just had a question about the, the map that we saw for what our ground lease portfolio contained didn't have any properties on the waterfront or in Tanaka Civic Square. Can you just explain why those aren't part of the ground lease portfolio at the moment? Yes, and I will look to um, David and, and Peter on the line to help out where I where I go wrong. But at the moment, we're not leasing anything in Tanako Civic Square. That's all. That's all us. Um, so it may be that there's a future opportunity for ground lease there, but there's not one that we currently receive revenue from now. Um, and the waterfront, um, David, have we not shown ones where we've sold a long term lease? Are we just showing the ones that we have the annual returns on? Yeah, that's Peter here. That's correct. Yeah. So, for uh, example, uh, Peter, they're often the ones on the waterfront have been a 99 year term or? Uh, minimum. Minimum, yeah. 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 There are a couple of other properties that weren't displayed on the map. So some, correct me, Peter, if I'm wrong, but some residential in, in Miramar and maybe the top of the cable car, for example. Yeah, sure. I was just com com interested in those two. Um, my final question about the ground lease portfolio is the officers are proposing that we change the conditions of sale for ground leases. Does that need consultation? How? What would the process be around doing that? Yeah, so I sought um, 
legal advice on, on that point when they reviewed the paper for me. And um, effectively, the policy isn't a policy. It was a decision made by council, um, I think, in 1999. And so it's a decision that you can make at council, you know, in, in this group here. Our resolution doesn't need to be consulted on. Yeah, and if I can just add to that, Sarah and Councillor Condi, um, it, it really speaks to the significance of the decision as to whether or not you'd, uh, consultation is required. And in our view, um, those changes aren't uh, of such a significant nature that they would require consultation themselves. Thank you, um, Councillor Young. So, um, so say we decided to sell the airport and we sold it to, I don't know, Mother Teresa's virtue fund or something, something which everyone thought was fantastic. And then in five years time, they decided as Heathrow Airport did to sell a majority share to Qatar, to a Canadian investment fund, to Spanish, et cetera, et cetera. When we, we, can, we may be able to be incredibly purist about who we sell to, but we have no controls about the on-selling, do we? Uh, Councillor, Councillor Young, just as we have no control of who Infratel sell their majority shareholding to right now. Yeah, but, but we still have um, our minority shareholding. Yes, but anyway, yes. you have the question. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Councillor Firm? Councillor Young just took my main question, framed in a slightly different way to what I would have put it, but nevertheless, <laughs> um, I think uh, one of the questions I have is on um, just around understanding that this is significant. Um, have we taken ex external advice on, on our portfolio and or on our balance sheet and um, yeah, just what, what possible options we have? So, and sorry, Sarah, that's not, not questioning your amazing ability. <laughs> no, um, Councillor Foom and, and limited ability and capacity. Um, yeah. uh, yes, when we did the initial overall balance sheet review, um, EY supported us in that process, um, as they did in Auckland when they conducted the balance sheet review there. So it was a, an efficient process that they are well versed at. Um, and information about that you've received in the paper around... Um, the potential um, proceeds strategy, um, the performance of the funds and the airport performance um, have been supported by PwC. Great. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Well, that's the end of the questions. Um, and so what I will do is I will introduce the paper. I'll, I'll, move, the, um, I'll move the recommendations as they are. Um, I just want to thank officers for doing this um, um, balance sheet review. I think it's important that we do this um, on a regular basis, uh, appropriate to the um, to the size of the assets, um, because we're in changing times at the moment, and um, and I'm sure it will continue to change um, more frequently than perhaps it has done in the past. Um, and so we have um, we are fine. Um, we are stewards for the city currently, and we need to ensure that um, we do. Um, apply good governance to uh, making sure that our assets are working for us, the delivering on what we expect, and um, and also that, and in particular, that we think about the well-being of our city and the future of our city, and also recognizing. I think somebody made a comment. Um, um, we uh, um, our assets in terms of the region because our territorial boundary is just a, a line on the map. And it could easily shift. So um, we need to be um, conscious of that. Um, as you know, there's two parts to this. The first part is about our shares in the airport, which is a, a significant strategic asset. So anything we decide today, if we do decide that um, to go out to consult, then we will um, um, it will follow um, the um, our policy in terms of this. Um, the other part is the ground lease reviews, and um, and that again is I think pretty self-explanatory there. So um, I'm going to um, move these recommendations. Um, do I have a second? And I know people put is that sorry, oh, sorry. Um, is Councillor Condi, would you wish to second? I'm happy to second if there's no one else lined up to do so. Yep. Okay, that's great. Just because you second doesn't mean you have to vote for anything on here. Um, 
um, because I'm, I'm far, far be it for me to try and um, um, change these um, recommendations. I think there's, there's, yeah, I think there's quite a bit of information here, and I think it will come down to our personal, um, our, some, perhaps our personal views on this. Um, just one final thing. I, I'm just conscious of time. It says quarter past two. So if you are speaking, could I ask that you keep your um, speeches as succinct as possible? We don't have speaking limits, but I, I'd appreciate if you um, just get to the heart of the matter. Um, so Councillor Condi, would you wish to speak now? Yes, please. Thank you. Um, I just want to start by thanking the officers for doing this review of our balance sheet. I think it's something that, as Councillor Calvert has said, we actually need to do at regular intervals. Um, and you know, acknowledging that our investment portfolio in the council is really more a historical accident rather than a deliberate set of decisions in terms of trying to put together a balanced and diversified portfolio. Um, I think I really appreciate the detailed analysis that's gone in to kind of identify some of the, the risks that are associated with our portfolio around particularly the geographic um, dens density of and location of our portfolio because you know, one of the main things that we might want to be able to use this for is in the event of some kind of natural disaster, that this is capital that we have available to us to support us. But if we've had a natural disaster in the city um, and all our assets are in the city, that is a problem. Um, so I think it is, there is a, a genuine issue here around, a, around risk management and the diversification of the portfolio. Um, I think, you know, there's also a genuine issue here around if we were able to change the diversity of the report, the portfolio so that it was more secure in the event of a, of a natural hazard, for example, um, that we could then actually reduce the debt headroom that we are needing to keep aside for insurance coverage, which would actually free up more debt for us, more headroom for us to be able to borrow for things that we really need to support the growth of the city, like the three waters infrastructure that we need. We know we need um, improving kind of low carbon transport options, all of those great things we want to invest in. Um, there, are, there are genuine, by, by shifting up the, the way that our portfolio is balanced, um, we would actually free up our ability to do more of that kind of spending that we know is really necessary. Um, and I also think it's, it is an interesting opportunity for us to get greater strategic alignment between our goals and the assets that we invest in. Um, and I think this is one of the issues that I come to with the airport. And when we, when we were campaigning, I personally did talk about the idea of whether we should sell the airport, our stake in the airport, um, because I do think that it's actually not a great strategic fit or strategic alignment um, with our current goals as a council. And it's a challenge because the public think that we have influence that we just don't as owners because we have a minority stake uh, in, the, in the airport. We really don't have control of that asset. We don't have as much influence as people think that we do. Um, which is which can be frustrating for everybody involved. Um, I think there is also an issue of of not an actual conflict of interest, but it sometimes feels like there's a conflict of interest. I feel conflicted when I'm trying to discuss the airport because on the one hand, I'm trying to be a good shareholder and I'm trying to make sure that we are you know protecting the the um, value of this investment for our ratepayers and and doing right by them. But on the other hand, we might, I might have strong views about the business the airport is in or issues around climate change and issue, issues around regulation. And it, you can feel quite, it, it's quite challenging to, to hold both of those um, at the same time. And I think it's, that that is a really challenging situation. The other thing that I've, I've really got a sense of is, is we're not a good shareholder. <laughs> and, and I don't mean that in a, in a, dismissive way to anybody but like one of the main things is we just don't have a lot of capital available to invest right you, a good you know a shareholder that is like cashed up and ready to invest and expand and invest in the business that's the kind of shareholder you want and we're just not in that situation we've got our own financial pressures we, we know how much we're going to have to spend on three waters and all these other things we're right up against our headroom we're not really in a position to do to be that for the airport um you know we obviously have challenges around relationship management when because when we have to talk about things like climate change or resilience um, and, and try and manage those issues in our regulatory role as well. Um, so I think it, it, is, it is a challenge where I feel like we're not actually, it, it just doesn't seem like a good fit anymore to me, genuinely. Um, I, I appreciate that the officers are suggesting that we don't, not that we sell this and then use the proceeds to pay down debt and just make our portfolio smaller, but it's not, it's about transferring to a different set of assets and changing the balance of the portfolio. And the particularly the things that we could invest in 
would be really good things that we want to invest in, like Councillors Rush Wind Farm or other environmentally um, wonderful investments that we could make that would be more strategically aligned with us, but still deliver the financial outcomes that we need for ratepayers. Um, I don't think that I would be supporting this if we were just talking about um, using the proceeds of this, of this asset to just pay down debt. Um, it just doesn't make financial sense at, at this time. So I think that that part of thinking about how we're going to reinvest those the proceeds into into other investments is really really important. So Condi, can I get you to wrap up? Um, yeah, I pretty much was okay. about to do that. Okay. <laughs> um, okay. I think it's uh, great that we're able to have this conversation in public because I think it is a really sensitive issue, and I know that um, councillors will there. You know, this is a very politically sensitive issue and there will be lots of strong opinions about it and I think it's important that we can just have that conversation in public um, and and um, reassure people who will be very nervous about this potential or who will oppose it strongly that we're running a good process here it's above board um, it's it's gonna it's gonna follow a careful decision making path that will allow plenty of opportunities for further debate and for consultation. Thank you, thank you Councillor Condi. <laughs> so, okay I'm um, Councillor Panis. You and I will be very brief. Thank um, you. So unusually for me, I am I could have gone either way on this vote. Um, I see pros and cons on both sides, and I think I'm going to hear compelling arguments through this debate. I think it's an excellent paper, and um, I really appreciate the officers bringing it to us. And saying that, I'm going to vote against it. Um, but like I say, it was a bit of a knife edge. Um, so let's start with the fact that this is a dirty asset. Um, it is a contributor to climate change. The airport is constantly requesting roading, um, which makes it even worse. Um, there are some issues around, yeah, about whether we'd get a good partner, just like we've had some issues, um, yeah, around Wellington electricity and all the rest of it. And we don't have any influence, really, when it comes down to it. But on the other... On the other hand, I have been a strong opponent of asset sales. I do not believe that public authorities should get rid of their assets. I think this country would have been stronger and better if we had not embarked on the reform of the 80s and the 90s. We also live on an island, which is a long way away from where most of the world's population lives. And so there are some obvious advantages in that. And I was just talking to one of uh, my green colleagues. I don't want to deprive young people of the ability to travel one day when it's more environmentally sustainable, or at least to travel infrequently. Um, being able to travel is one of the world's greatest privileges and honours if you are lucky enough to have the resources. We do need to do it on occasion. Um, so I will be opposing it, but I do appreciate that there are some very, very compelling arguments around the fact that it is such a dirty asset and that there are other ways that we could invest our money. Kia ora. Thank you, Councillor Panett and Councillor for silence. I just want to, um, following on from Councillor Panett, I think that privatisation of the airport would be a backward step. It should be subject to an election. It's not a decision that should ever be made lightly. I think we've got a half-baked proposal here. There hasn't been proper analysis or proper information. The suggestion is that it gets incorporated into the annual plan I think that would be completely inappropriate. It, is, it is needs its own discussion um, if this does go through today, and I hope it won't. And I just want to pick up on comments that Councillor Pennett made around um, it being a dirty asset. It's important to remember that emissions from the airport will not reduce because we get rid of our shareholding in it. And actually, it's likely to end up in international finance, in, in, in the hands of global capital. And they do not have a good record when it comes to reducing emissions or climate change. They have a terrible record. And I think it's important as well to reflect on the comments of Steve Sanderson this morning when I asked him about Mayor Celia Wade Brown's contribution to the airport board, because I know that she did make a positive contribution. She did have an influence. We do have an influence. It's a significant shareholding and it's does give us a genuine influence over how the airport operates. Asset sales have a terrible history in New Zealand. I think this would be a disastrous decision for Wellington. It is a strategic asset for our whole region. And if it came to a decision again about how we would support it financially, I would certainly take that very seriously and look very closely at it. Because this council has a conservative approach to borrowing. 
we can't meet even our current um, capital works program. We're not even close to meeting it. So I don't think that it's a smart move to get um, just to sell this airport at this time. And I think Wellingtonians will laugh at us for selling an airport during a global pandemic. Airports have suffered because of COVID and now is not the right time. Um, and I guess finally, I just want to reflect on the history that this airport and the sale of this airport has. And we heard that there'd been no analysis done of this. There's actually people who have written quite detailed studies of what happened. And people, students of politics will know that um, Winston Peters was dismissed by Jenny Shipley over the sale of Wellington Airport. It split this council. One of the councillors at the time, apparently, who was a bus driver, Ken Clark, surveyed his bus on the way to the council meeting about whether he should vote for the sale or not. And that's how it ended up not being sold. Um, this is a very, very difficult decision. We shouldn't be making it on the sparse information that we have today, which people wanted to discuss in private, which would have been very disappointing for Wellingtonians. They need to be a key part of this debate. But I also think the timing of this means that even if we did sell it, there's no guarantee that it will be spent in the way outlined in this paper. And if I agree, we need a more diversified portfolio, but we need to do that in the interests of Wellingtonians and the interests of Wellington. Um, and those interests include holding on to important strategic assets like the airport. Thank you, Councillor for Simons. Councillor Young. So first of all, I'd just like to say um, I love our airport. I love the fact that it's quite idiosyncratic, uh, and that's really because of its majority owners in Fratil. Um, I remember, some of you won't, I remember when it was owned by the government, and every time the royal family came over here, the Duke of Edinburgh would complain about that grotty old de Havilland hangar, which had been converted into our terminal. And the shock when I came back from Britain to find that they had this amazing new modern terminal. So... Um, the thing is, I think that the, uh, you know, I basically like private ownership, and that probably won't come as a surprise to you. Um, but I think the, um, the split between private and the city gives us the benefit of infertile skills and their deep love of Wellington, which they demonstrate with all the support they give to community and sporting events and the arts. Uh, and, and at the same time, we, we reinforce the community interest in our airport. And I think most of us, possibly with the exception of Iona, Councillor Panet, are really rather proud of our airport. Um, I'm also mindful of that, you know, when um, Harold McMillan accused Margaret Thatcher of selling the family silver, sometimes you have to pay, sell the family silver. It's a matter of what you use the proceeds for. And I'm not convinced that the council would use them in a way that uh, future generations would think, would think was a good idea. I'm very nervous about what we would do with the proceeds. I totally understand the need for diversification. Uh, it's just, um, I don't, we, I mean, I know the mayor has told me we could ring fence it, but of course another council, a later council could unring fence it. And uh, I just think that the future of the airport is so important to us. It is our lifeline to the rest of the world. I can't wait to get to London, as I've told you every time I talk about the airport, to see my grandson. Um, the, my main reason is, you know, I love privatization, but I think this is a good mix. And I just would be very nervous about the decision of what, how we would invest the proceeds. So that's why I would be voting against any current plans to sell the airport. End of okay, thank, you. thank you, Councillor Young. Councillor Matthews. Koto, um, I guess I feel a very, I'm feeling a level of discomfort that makes me feel like the process that has led us to this debate and this decision isn't actually quite right. And it does seem to me to have happened extremely quickly. And that the sort of shock that um, the community is expressing right now as we're discussing this, um, I feel that myself. Um, and I think that is because um, this sort of highlights to me one of the problems I have with local government, that I don't think such a significant, obviously political decision should be coming outside of an election of, you know, of the politicians kind of, recommending it so to me you know it's not yes we couldn't diversify our portfolio I agree with that but we should be doing that by by you know uh, buying more things when we're able to or you know investing differently as we're able to um 
you know, that would be a recommendation that I could see as being natural and normal to come from offices. And it, it brings to mind, you know, Council Robert Simons talked about it earlier. I'm thinking about my first my first day where I wasn't even really a councillor and I was like, because I didn't know if I was going to be here. Um, and uh, I went into the mayor's office and he had a checklist of, you know, like a hundred different things he wanted me to give a yes, no answer to if I supported them. And uh, this was one of them. And so, it, it, you know, it is political. It's, you know, and to sort of, Sort of be in this kind of mix where that's kind of this decision is unrelated to that day. I don't. It isn't. You know, it isn't unrelated. Um, and the, I don't think the public will see it that way. Um, so yes, I also made a commitment um, before the election um, through a process um, that was run by Unions Wellington that I wouldn't be selling assets. And um, it's quite important to me for my integrity to uphold um, the commitments that I make um, unless, you know, and of course there may be circumstances under which you need to change things, but nothing in this paper convinces me that I should be doing that today. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Matthews. I'm Councillor Day. Uh, kia ora koutou. Um, so just very briefly, um, I think I really want to speak to the um, concern that I have, I guess, around the timing of this. Um, everything we make, every decision we make from now when it's got a process coming after it um, creeps into a, a period of time where we know um, it will get very tangled up. And, um, and one of the things I can also see with this is that we will... Um, we will end up in the situation where we will be we will be certain that that we can we can sort it out and make sure it's safe and the money won't be spent on anything else. But I know that the next council will be able to find a way to change the process. And if that if it is so desired, then you can just pay down the debt, and then we have lost a, a really important um, income stream in the future. Um, I was really interested to hear um, from Steve about the influence that Celia Wade Brown um, had when she was on the board and about social license. And um, I guess maybe it makes me wonder at the moment with the conversations that we're having, whether our, our link and our connection at the moment isn't um, what it could be. And maybe we really do need to think about reviewing that. Um, I know that the mayor is very busy um, in his role and maybe actually we should be thinking about um, who can be in there and who can really um, make sure that the, the interests of this council are being reflected um, into, into the community there at the airport. So that's probably something just to put out there. But um, So I won't be um, supporting... Um, the going out to consultation on divesting of the airport, it just doesn't, to me, the timing just doesn't feel right. And I, I do agree that I think it really is such a big political decision. I think it really should be led by the politicians through a, a process where we feel that we've got the got a democratic um, decision behind us with the community backing whatever happens. Kia ora. Thank you. Um, Councillor O'Neill. Uh, thank you. I just briefly wanted to touch on... Um, yeah, I guess I do not support selling off any of these major public assets. And I also feel a degree of um, being uncomfortable that this kind of debate is being held. And at the moment, the, the airport um, has said that they do not currently have a position on it. And this is a discussion between Wellington City Council and Infertil. And I guess what I'm concerned about is the lack of uh, the risk. I mean, I don't necessarily agree with Wellington Airport on a lot of things um, but they are a member of my community and um, if we sell off our shares or consult to sell off our shares we lose the ability to hold them accountable and um, we lose the ability to challenge them when we think a neighbour's day hasn't gone well or when the airport flyer um, drops out of service and we can build that relationship with Greater Wellington if we sell off that asset then we no longer have access to those um, conversations necessarily and we also for example things like our climate change goals and lobbying on sustainability they won't have to come into a pub public forum like they have done this morning and, and be accountable for that um councillor rush if wellington city council wanted to invest in excellent things like wind farms i'm sure we could if we made it a priority um, this organization spends one billion dollars every six months so we have you know potentially you do have the strategic power to maybe put that on the table. And I'm sure that our colleagues might, might support looking into those things as well. Uh, lastly, 
um, yeah, an ongoing commitment and uh, something that is so fundamental as to not rush out a consultation on an asset sale. I think it's really unfair because regardless of this process, it will require an amendment to the long-term plan. We just passed the long-term plan and now we're going out to potentially debate this again. I think that the community just maybe needs to slow down a little bit. We've also heard from others that there's mad consultation fatigue at the moment. So with that, uh, um, yeah, I'll leave it there. Thank you. And Councillor Fern? Uh, kia ora. Yes, interesting debate for today. And I do really want to thank Wellington Airport for coming in this morning and, and having that conversation with us. And actually, we need to do that more because, you know, when, when we talked about what are the two levers we've got, and one of them is relationship. And I, you know, I know that we have tried to have, have some semi-regular meetings with Wellington Airport. They've been informal, some formal, but I think we need to really uh, work a lot harder on that. I'd like to um, acknowledge their work and sustainability in that they, they gained accreditation. I don't know what their benchmarking system was for around 95%. But I think that shows also that many private companies are moving in this way. So that, that governance, um, that investor governance, if you're an investor, you don't really invest in um, non-sustainable um, companies or projects anymore. So this is the way the world is going, which could also lead into another argument of why we might look at, you know, not, you know, looking to um, invest elsewhere. But I guess one thing I wanted to bring up today is that I don't think we've been that great a shareholder. Thank you, Councillor Condi, for bringing that up. We didn't want to invest in the infrastructure when it was asked of us. And, you know, we made the decision not to do that. Politically, the airport extension is really hard. Um, and that's something else that we're going to have to face in our time. And just that infrastructure support that's required of us when I agree, we can, we've got different ways of looking at our debt and the way we deal with it, but it is, it's big money that we're talking about. So I want us to be mindful of that. Um, but yes, I think the other interesting thing to look at is sometimes it feels like, actually, I'll just leave it there. So thank you. That's my two cents. Um, thank you, Councillor Fern. Councillor Rush. Um, yeah, hey, really good debate, guys. Um, but I, I have to say, I'm not going to repeat everything Councillor Condi said, but I just totally agreed uh, and embrace uh, what, what she was saying. And I was going to say some similar things. I mean, it is a, a fairly standard uh, road that councils and governments go on, whereby they invest, particularly in large-scale infrastructure, that private investors don't like and don't want to do because it's too risky. Um, and it needs a lot of coordination and so forth. And that's how we ended up with uh, the legacy of ownership in this airport, because Wellington City needed an airport and uh, there, there were no airport investors in, in, uh, on the radar back in the, I think it was the 50s uh, when it got upgraded anyway. So, uh, and I think, um, you know, selling down to invest in pub genuine public goods, like a sewage treatment plant is the right thing to do. Um, maintaining a, a, an asset holding with, with, with no uh, power or, or voting rights of, of any significance. Um, when you've got people crying out in poverty in your own housing, it just doesn't sit very well with me. And I do think that, um, yeah, Councillor O'Neill, you, you talk about we could be investing in wind farms. Um, you know, what we are investing in is cycleways. But I did have a look on Meridian's um, website. So they've got 10 consented wind farms uh, ready to go. And you can guarantee that uh, the reason why they're not pulling the trigger on them is because of investment. And uh, there's certainly partner opportunities that I would really like to lead, um, you know, if, if we were to, to move ahead. But, but let's just be uh, very careful here, guys. I mean, we're talking about going out for consultation to have those sort of discussions where we can really flesh out what our community actually wants rather than uh, respond to, um, I understand some of you being contacted, I personally haven't. Um, so I'm a little bit unsure about where the, um, where the, the public um, mood is on this. So I'd like to test that. Um, we talk also about making, you wanna make an election issue guys, make an election issue. 
by going out for consultation because then next year we can all stand up and say well, we're going to go ahead with it. So I think that does kind of address the the um, the, the democratics, I suppose, of it. Um, Councillor Matthews, I really respect uh, that you are prepared to uphold what you promised to your constituents, uh, so I don't take issue with that. Um, I think, um, Councillor Young, I do understand your nervousness with reinvestment because um, a lot of investment I think we've done may, may have been done better. But nevertheless, I think we should, um, we should ask our community what they think. Um, and then if it comes back that it's a possible, then that will be right front and centre next year in the elections. And we can all choose to campaign however we want. I can see your lips moving, Fleur. <laughs> Is that, anyway, that's, it'll that's be too all. late. Um, thank you, Councillor Rush. I'm Councillor Wall. Yeah, thank you. And thanks for the debate. It's been really interesting. Um, what I'd like to say is, firstly, um, thanks to the officers for being um, nimble and agile and bringing this to us. Um, because I think that it's, it's important that um, we don't lose sight of, of opportunities. In saying that, um, I don't believe that this is the right time. Um, you know, I, I, I won't be um, voting for um, consultation on the, on the airport at this time. I actually think that um, Infratrol and um, the airport company are doing really, really well, um, given the, the environment that, that we're in at the moment. Um, I think that um, they're, they're free and frank with us. Um, I, I, I've always thought that, that Steve Sanderson's um, been straightforward with, with his dealings with, with council. Um, and and I, I, I also um, have been watching what Infratrol have been doing um, as a company over the last five or six years. And, and their part of, of their company culture relates to social license, it relates to climate change, it relates to all the things that, that we as a council um, would like to see in a company that we have a relationship with. Um, in saying that, and, and I'm gonna be quite brutal here. I think that some of us, and, and I, I'm not including me as us, um, think that profit's a dirty word. And, and I think um, by, by just um, exercising a little bit of confidence in, in um, Infratrol at, at, at the current, current time and our airport company and, and not um, creating instability, um, I think that we would be doing a good thing. I, I think that also from our, um, from from the other things that we're dealing with at the moment, and, and they are many and, and, and equally as important. Um, I think that the airport actually is in, in good hands at the moment and that we, we should be concentrating on, on, on other aspects and not, not having um, this as being a little bit of a distraction. I'll leave it there. Um, thank you, Councillor Wolf. I'm Councillor Paul. Kia ora, um, just briefly, just in the spirit of debate, I just wanted to challenge this thing that keeps getting mentioned that we're not willing to commit um, infrastructure funding as a, a shareholder. The reason we removed that $70 million was because we didn't have enough information on what it was for and it was unclear whether it was for a runway extension or whether it was for a seawall. So it's not, I think it's not that we're not willing to commit investment. It's actually that we needed more clarity um, that should be provided by our council representatives and by um, those that are on the board and that relationship that we have. The other thing I'd raise is that um, we actually don't have a lot of power if we don't own shares in the airport because the regulatory powers that we believe we have over the airport are actually really weak. Um, we can see that through the airport expansion process that is happening currently where the airport has gone out and facilitated its own process where it's um, consulted with the community and uh, Wellington City Council has provided commissioners but then um, they can make recommendations, but at the end of the day, the decision is ultimately made by the airport. So there is very little public accountability, regardless of whether we have um, formal regulatory powers over the airport. So I think it is important that we do have other ways to hold them accountable. So I think we shouldn't shut ourselves out of future opportunities to own more of the airport and that if it was totally publicly owned, um, we would be able to have more of a say on how quickly they transition to a uh, a climate safe future um, and I actually support publicly owned public transport um, 100% and that is what we're talking about here um, because I can't imagine a world where nobody at all flies in planes and all of us here have had to fly to visit family members um, and, and stuff like that so you know 
it's about making it work and um yeah and I, I don't support global capitalism we don't know who would buy our shares um and yes we have to divest from fossil fuels um but again uh, airports are public transport and that's what we need to remember and I think there needs to be a discrete process if we really want to go down this way and I think we should consider our representation um on the airport to ensure more transparency um, in that process. Um, thank you, Councillor Paul. Um, Mayor Foster. Yeah, look, um, very interesting discussion. Um, and I just want to start off by saying thank you to officers for doing, I think this is the first substantial um, review that we've had of our um, asset portfolio in a very long time. Um, I've got to say, I'm, I'm with Councillor Young in saying that I'm very proud of the airport that we've got. Um, I think it's, um, you said quirky, I think was the word you used, but I, I think it is. It's got a, it's got a, a unique character. I think it's very well laid out. Um, it's obviously, um, you know, it's miles better than what we had, um, you know, going back to the old tin shed. Uh, and I think it is something that we should be proud of. Look, I know um, some of our um, residents are not particularly uh, keen on it uh, and not particularly keen on its, its growth projections, but... Um, you know, it is about trying to provide a high quality asset for our city. Um, Councillor Panic, you, you said something about um, almost as though if we were to sell our minority shareholding, stress minority shareholding in the airport, somehow the airport wouldn't be there. It was almost the implication. Of course, it's going to be there. It's just a matter of who owns the airport and um, not whether it's going to be there and keep on doing the, the work that it's it's doing. I think some people would like to send it up to Paraparum or somewhere else, but um, it's, it's there and it's there for the long haul. Um, I, um, I actually got involved in politics in the first place in part because of a Labour government which decided it wanted to go on an asset selling binge. Um, and I didn't like that and I didn't like the way they did that. Uh, they certainly didn't consult. The proposition here is that we would consult if this goes through. Um, we would certainly consult with our community. Um, I think that New Zealand over many, many, many decades has been very, very poor in what it's been doing is it's sold assets essentially to pay for the groceries. And I think what's different here is the proposition is to sell one asset and then invest it in a series of other assets, a portfolio of, of assets. I am a little concerned by some of what I've heard from some members around the table, probably well-intentioned, about investing in various different things which probably would not receive a particularly significant um, revenue stream. And I think the key bit here is that the um, any proceeds, if we were to sell, are taken away from uh, <laughs> councils fiddling around with it. You know, we might provide some overall guidance, but they're professionally managed outside of our political, um, our political management. I think that would be a terrible way of doing things. For me, the biggest thing here is whether you think we should really have so much of our um, revenue earning asset base tied up in one asset. That's the key bit here. And I asked you that question at the beginning, because a number of you have, uh, beginning of the trial, even a number of you referred to that about asset recycling. And my thinking there, I didn't know COVID was coming. None of us knew COVID was coming. But we, what we've seen is that when COVID arrived and the airport's revenue went from hero to zero overnight, it cost, has cost us at least two years of dividend income. And probably that, that tail might be a bit longer. That's had a very direct impact on our rating base or on our rates. Um, and it's part of the reason that our rates increase is as high as it is. Um, I wasn't, that wasn't actually what I had in mind when I was um, concerned about, uh, originally about um, income diversification or portfolio diversification. I was actually interested, and I looked back at the, um, the tourism strategy for the country, which was a pre-COVID thing, and essentially it said that tourism in this country will recover from just about everything. Of course, they didn't know about COVID either. There was one big... Um, if you like, game changer on the horizon, and it was climate change. And I guess that's where I see some of us around this table being conflicted between saying, look, we're concerned about climate change, but at the same time here, as Diana, you said, you talked about it as being a, a dirty industry. There is a conflict between those two. And I'm interested in where our community would lie on that conflict. Because I think most people go, don't like selling assets. Most people also go, don't like the climate change implications of this. So I think it's a really interesting uh, conversation to have. The final thing I wanted to say um, is that I, I, have, um, I have had some conversations with the Mayor of New Plymouth, not specifically about this, but I did note that um, they have tried very hard in, to put a, a, an asset portfolio together and effectively take it away from councillors' control, put it 
there so the council gets the income but is not able to fiddle with the capital. And I think that's the key there. If we could be sure of that, this, that would be okay. If we couldn't be sure of that, that would be a real concern uh, for me. So for me, it's about you know, a sensible question being raised about asset diversification. There are risks in owning an airport, which perhaps we didn't acknowledge before. Um, and it's just something that I think we need to think about very, very carefully. And I think our community needs to think about it very carefully too. Thank you, Mayor Foster. Deputy Mayor Free. Thank you. I hope everyone can hear me because you're, you were all very faint. So hopefully you can hear me. Um, look, I think most of it's been said before for me. I'm really conflicted about this one because, um, uh, you know, I do think that, um, I do question whether an airport is the right business for a council to be involved in, even as a minority shareholder. And I do also understand the um, arguments about diversification. And if we were to suddenly find we had a, a a, a event in the city or a, a natural disaster that we would have all our eggs in one basket and it mightn't be the most resilient thing to do but I have been listening really really carefully to the, the, the debate and what I have actually concluded from listening to all of you is that this probably for me isn't quite the right time it does feel a little bit premature I think it will come as quite a surprise to the community at a time when they're being surprised by a lot of other different things so I guess um, I sat there and thought how urgent is this because it might be something that we will consider in the future. Um, I'm not saying never um, personally to this particular asset sale. I have stood, I, I also got into politics basically on a platform of assets, of opposing asset sales. In, this, in my case, it was the electricity assets that um, the key government um, decided to sell. Fortunately, only sold 49%. So we do in that case still have a controlling um, influence which we don't have over the airport. Um, I think reluctant, somewhat reluctantly, I'm actually going to vote against this. I don't think it, for me, it, I have listened carefully to the arguments about whether this is the right time, whether we know enough about the pros and cons, and whether, we've, um, whether our community is just going to find this one more thing that we're asking them to think seriously about, and it is a significant decision, on top of a lot of other things that we're also asking them to think seriously about. So I've kind of gone one way and then the other way and back around in a circle, but I think I will actually not be supporting this at this particular time. Thank you. Um, Councillor Condi, I see you have your hand up, but you've already spoken, so. Yeah, but that's not against standing orders at this committee. So I just wanted to quickly, um, I, I had a couple more things that I wanted to say. I promise yeah. I won't be talking about the airport or responding well, to anybody else. Councillor Condi, no, I, I know I won't. I know you, you can, but we, we're already close to three o'clock. You've, you've had a good, um, chance to talk so um i'm we're going to go to well the i wanted to specifically now. address um some items that people might want to take separately and and the fact because a number of people are, are looking at voting against this, this happy, happy to take happy, happy to take items separately um but we'll do that um, well, it's part of the, it's part of debate point of order can i just get some clarity because i thought um I, you may correct me, but I don't know if that's up to the discretion of the chair and deputy chair, but can we just get some advice on whether Councillor Conley can speak again? Um, I think it's up to the discretion of the chair from my understanding um, in terms of um, I'm- It chair can be challenged. It can be challenged. Ma Ma Madam, Madam Chair, with respect, um, it's not up to the chair on this one unless we've changed the standing order, yeah. which I don't think you have. Yeah, but I'm also conscious of time. We've got a number of. Well, I'm sure Councillor Conley is conscious well of time of too. I would be finished if we just, hadn't been doing just this. Minute, just, just a minute. Well, rather than just us argue for the next two minutes, Councillor Conley, I'll give you two minutes because you already had about six minutes in the speech before. So you could be as, as succinct as possible. That would be much Absolutely. appreciated. That would be my great pleasure. Um, yeah. Just for a number of councillors who are obviously saying they want to vote against that, which I totally respect, I just want to draw your attention to, if you are interested in supporting the idea of a diversified investment portfolio and what that might look like, then I would encourage you to vote for number seven, but you might vote against the other things. So if you want to see a bit more work done on that, kind of leading up to the election, then, then I'd just encourage you to look at number seven. And I also quickly wanted to talk to number 11, which is about the ground lease sales, because we haven't really talked about ground lease sales during the debate. And just remind everyone that that one is really about trying to open up housing opportunities because ground lease sales work fine for commercial developments, but they tend not to work well when you want to build ha residential housing on them. So that number 11 was specifically to make it easier if we've got some land in our lease portfolio that would be good for residential developments to make that easier. So I just wanted to remind you of those two things before we vote. Thank you. 
And thank you. And I'll do the right reply now. Thank you. Um, so, look, um, it's been an interesting debate. And, um, and I think, like many, um, everyone was really interested in hearing the debate and hearing the different points of view. Um, I do take um, exception. Somebody made a comment about half baked proposal. I don't think that this is not the intention. And I just want to thank officers for actually bringing it to our attention. You know, if mm. we, you probably wouldn't be having this discussion if they hadn't brought this forward because we may not well have thought about that in this, in this regard. So um, I do thank officers for, um, for um, bringing this forward. Um, it's, um, it, it's a key strategic asset for the city. It's not a dirty asset, um, you know, because that, that's purely um, subjective. Um, I think, I don't think rushing out, we wouldn't be rushing out for consultation. We would be going for consultation in, in the normal way. Um, but I think the other thing is, I think there's a piece of engagement that needs to happen before we go out to a form, consultation is a formal process. Um, and so I think we need to, we're really talking about better engagement. Um, there was discussion about Infratel. Well, I know at the end of last year, there was a, a, a potential takeover of Infratel from an Australian um, um, group. And that could easily happen going forward into the future. So we just don't know who, um, who will be the, our other shareholding partner. Um, but I do take some comfort from um, a lot of the comments being made in support of our, our um, holdings in the airport. Um, because actually we do have to be a good partner. Um, in if we are, if we own shares at ill bit a third, we do have to be a good partner. And I do take comfort from a number of comments um, noting that um, because in the past it's felt that um, um, we, we may have had different aspirations um, for them than um, what could be realistically expected. Um, um, so for me, I, I won't be supporting their proposals. I think there's too much, there's too much other work that we need to do beforehand. I think we need to be, do a broader engagement with, um, um, with the public over this. And also, I just don't believe that we as a council perhaps are in the best position to make the right decisions at this point in time. Um, I think that we would need to um, wait a bit longer um, for that. And I think there's plenty of time now for that engagement to happen with the public and um, in terms of um, seeking their feedback, but it doesn't have to be in that formal consultation, whether that happens next year or the year later or, or in two years time. But we will need to address um, the issues about diversification of our portfolio for purely from a risk management perspective. Um, but in the meantime, while we are shareholders of the airport, I do, um, um, I would like to see that we do become that supportive partner as well and more, it will represent that more in a way. So um, I know that we'll probably be taking these, which ones do people want to be taking um, separately? Um, Any particular views on, on yes. that? Yep, so the ones to take separately are 1, 2, 7, 10 and 11. Are you suggesting they could be taken together, those ones? Well, they could for me, but I can't speak for other people. Okay, yep. So that, so that basically is, I'll just- Diana, pretty... Diana, I think you might need to rip, might need to walk through them all. Okay, all right. Yeah, well, some, well, of them are actually, some of them are actually contingent on others as well. Could, mm. we, um, could we do the one and two together? Two. Is everybody okay with do one and two together? Yes. Well, and number three is, number three is just noting. You can do that as well. Can't you do the noting ones as well? No. All right. Can okay. I ask a question? Just yep. um, please, with the leave of the chair, it's yep. a question of officers and advice around the consequence of voting for some and not the others. Which ones were you? Um, 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 you so my definitely? question is, if we vote against going out to consult on the airport sale, is there still any point in agreeing some of those other ones, like agreeing oh. that um, the proceeds of sale of assets are reinvested in other income? I mean, you know, which ones are inconsistent? I Condi addressed this during the debate, and we don't usually go back to officer advice once we've debated. Okay, it is okay. that some of them are quite 
codependent. No, that's I the think, only thing. I think, I think the easy way to do that is how about we um, we do one and two, and then we'll go straight to eight. Okay. Okay, so Heidi, we're gonna we're gonna vote on on numbers one and two together. Um, I'll do a division for all of them if I may. Just waiting on Councillor Pennant. I think she might have had to go. Yeah, I think she had, she had to leave by a certain time. Um, in that case, that's 14 votes in favour. That's carried unanimously on clauses one and two. Okay. Um, I am going to, um, we'll go to um, recommendation eight. Uh, just waiting on Deputy Mayor Free. Um, I voted against it, but I'm trying to do it on a very small screen. Um, in that case, that has lost with four votes in favour and 10 votes against. Those votes in favour were Liz Kelly, Councillor Condi, Councillor Rush and Mayor Foster. That's on Clause 8. Okay, so... Um... We will now go to um, um, number three. We'll, we'll, go, we'll work through them in order. Number three. Which is note the review has identified. Uh, so that has carried 10 votes in favour, four votes against. Those against were Councillor Fitzsimons, Councillor Day, Councillor Matthews, and Councillor O'Neill, with Councillor Panna absent. Okay. Um, number Uh, just putting our votes from Councillor Condi, Councillor Foon, and Deputy Mayor Free. That's number four. Uh, just waiting on you, Deputy Mayor. Uh, so that has carried nine votes in favour, five votes against. Those against are Councillor Fitzsimons, Councillor Day, Councillor Matthews, Councillor Paul, and Councillor O'Neill, with Councillor Panett absent. Okay, so um, I'm just looking at numbers um, five, six, seven, whether they're now pretty much defunct. And that stage. was my question. I think, um, Madam Chair, it would actually be quite useful to ask officers if they are considered defunct so that we don't, so don't have to bother voting on them. Or, yeah, or... I think so, because, I mean, it might be that they come back later on with this, but it's not it's not the timing for this one now. Um, I just wonder whether officers could provide some advice, whether we, um, we'll just put, can we just... So if you are, if you are um, going to agree to the change in the ground lease portfolio, you could then reinvest those proceeds, if any, into a diversified fund. It just wouldn't be very big, right? So we could still keep. So we could still. Um, okay. All right. So I'm just. Um, so you're saying if we don't agree to keep the ground lease portfolio. 
if you agree to amend the ground lease portfolio to enable sales that would um, create development opportunity for housing, you yeah. could use the proceeds of those ground lease sales to reinvest in a diversified portfolio, but you could also use those proceeds to, um, you know, invest yeah. in pay down debt or whatever it is. They won't be a significant or material. Um, Chair, I've just got a question. Yep. Does number five kind of only change if number 11 is, because that, that would be where the ground lease one comes yeah, in? Yeah, that's what I was thinking. Um, so do we need number 11 next? Yeah, I think we probably need to do, um, 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 I think we'll do um, 10, um, then 11, because they're both the ground lease ones, and one follows the other. Um, Can we chair, see those again, please? Hmm. Yep. Sorry, um, it's, it's, sorry, it's Tamitha here. Um, oh. Iona just said that she can hear and can see everything, but she's not able to vote or or anything. So can so she said her she wants to vote against everything except number seven. I can see she's still on the call, but must be having technical difficulties. But okay, all right, we'll we'll note that. But, um, Sorry, could you just repeat just... that one more time? Council Panner is voting against everything except for seven. Thanks. I will note that in the minutes. Oh. Chair, can I just ask the officers one more question in respect of those, um, uh, the portfolio type approach? And it's, ju it's just simply whether the cost of doing the work is worth it for the amount of money that would be likely to be available. Probably not. Sorry? Probably not. Okay, thank I you. I don't know. I would have to do some work to understand what the potential value was of the divestments. Thank you. All right. Okay, so we're going to number 10. Can I see it, please? Yeah. Um, so we'll vote on that now. Uh, just waiting on a vote from Liz Kelly and Deputy Mayor Free. Um, sorry, I put my icon up. I voted for. I, sorry, I don't know why it's not showing. <clears throat> uh, so that is 14 votes in favour with Councillor Panic on 10. Oh, bah, bah, bah. <laughs> <laughs> Democracy, Councillor Rush. Democracy. I didn't realise I was on. <laughs> okay. Um, um, Councillor Rush, you're up. Sorry, which one are we doing? 11. Is that right? Yeah, 11. I'm voting for it. Uh, so that is 14 votes in favour and one vote against. The one vote against being Councillor Panich. That's on clause 11. Um, so we go back to um, you're back to number five now. I, I think I just wonder whether that's actually still still actually relevant, even with voting for um, ten eleven being passed. It's can I suggest, moved can and can I suggest that you relevant. seek to do you have to seek the leave of the meeting to withdraw it if you want to? Yeah, I might just seek leave of the meeting to withdraw it. I think that might be the simplest way rather than vote it down and then, um, because that might be something that it will come yes. back up to another point. Well, it allows Sarah to go and have a look at things if she wants to. Yeah, to okay, so we'll, um, we'll, we'll, with the leave of the meeting, we're, re um, we're removing um, clause, um, recommendation five. Eight. Can I have officer advice on that? Is that something you're comfortable with, Sarah? <laughs> Ah, 
sorry, my mouse is not working. Um, I, um, yeah, that's fine. Um, it's just then whether you um, would do bother with six or seven either. Same thing, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. It just so allows you to have some thought, thought about it rather than us killing it. Yeah, so maybe we, we will remove five, six, and seven if, if the leave of the meeting, if everyone's comfortable with that. And probably number nine, because <laughs> so, it's a bit defunct, isn't it? <laughs> we don't need unanimity for this, do you? Because I'm, I'm a little bit uncomfortable with it. No, you know, I, I think I can sense by the leave of the meeting that we can remove yeah. five, six, um, seven, and nine. Unless anybody's got allergic reaction to any of that, uh, I think I've, I've seen a few thumbs up. Okay, yeah. we won't, but we won't. So we will remove those with leave of the meeting, and um, yeah. So that means that's the end of the of the voting. There we are. Um, now um, I'm also it's ten past three. I believe that we will have to extend this meeting. Um, so, Heidi, is this a good time to go to um, um, to put a motion forward to extend this meeting? Yes, that would be great. That just needs to be done before 3.30. Okay, so uh, if we could do that now. Um, Councillor, I'm sorry, Deputy Mayor Free, you had a... I'm voting for it. Ah, okay, thank you. Uh, just need a seconder as well, please. Oh, happy to second. Okay, thank you. Um, Okay, if you um, if everyone's comfortable, we'll just take a ten minute break now, um, and then I'll just get I'll just get make sure I've got the order of the papers coming up um, in in, in, a, in a, a good way <laughs> as many ways. Just um, Diane, I have to leave at five. Just FYI. Yeah, no, that's all right. I was meant to. I'm meant to be somewhere at three thirty. So, yeah. So do I. I need to go. Be gone by five. It, well, anyway, let's try and we'll move through the uh, um, the rest as quickly as we can. Um, yeah. Um, okay. Just confirming that the vote to extend the meeting has carried. Thank you very much. Um, so it is... Um, I forgot to vote, but I voted for it. Okay. <laughs> All right. So if we can come back uh, just, to, just to round the number up at 325 on the dot, we're ready to go. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.
Um, thank you all. Welcome back. Um, just to confirm the order of the um, meeting now, I've missed off a paper. So just very briefly, just to go through, we will do the paper on the briefing from um, Wellington International Airport. We'll then go into the report of the Audit and Risk Subcommittee. Um, we will then go to the Development Contributions Policy Paper. Uh, um, and then... Um, and then we'll finish off with the action tracking and the board program. Um, so please continue to hang in there. Um, and so we have the, um, the briefing from the International Airport paper. And it just seems such a long um, time ago. It was, um, I don't believe the officers needed to speak to this. No, we don't need to say anything. Okay. Look, um, and I'm sure we've been through this. So look, I am going to go straight to um, moving the officer's um, um, recommendations, um, um, which you will have there in front of you, but essentially to receive the public briefing and to have re received the public excluded briefing. Um, do I have a seconder? I can't see, I think it was Councillor O'Neill. Um, do you wish to speak? Sorry, Councillor Flynn. Uh, no, I do not wish to speak or reserve my right. Does anybody wish to speak to this paper? Wonderful. Um, um, so, oh, sorry, Councillor Thum. Yes, I do wish to speak to this okay. paper. <laughs> um, I think that we, we really need to invest in our relationship with Billington Airport. We've just made a clear decision. I think we also need to... Um, check in with our representative and maybe get an update from our represent, re representative regularly so that we, we are alongside the airport. I really would like to see some change here. And I really look forward to being a great shareholder alongside Wellington Airport as that's what we've decided to do today. So yeah, that's all I wanted to say. Thank you. Um, thank you, Councillor Fern. And I think it's a, a, a very timely um, comment and yeah. Um, I now see Councillor Rush. Oh, yes, of course. I look forward to being a great shareholder too, as the inevitable call for cash arises. Um, but I do wonder whether the chair of the Infrastructure Committee may, may be able to lessen the burden on the mayor 
and by perhaps taking the, the representation role on the board. Just throw it out there. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you, Councillor Rush. As if you haven't got enough on your plate. Um, Okay, so look, thank you, thank you for those um, the comments. But um, yes, no, I think um, we we got a very fulsome briefing, and for what the public could see, I think they would have um, certainly had a much better understanding of our um, of the what the airport's plans are over the next few years, and certainly um, our um, our investment in there. So look, I'm going to just quickly, we'll just move to the vote. I'm assuming everyone would be comfortable if we take those two um, recommendations together. I don't see any dissensions. So look, um, you, you know, green for obviously proving them, red for no. Madam Chair, Liz Kelly called to say that she is picking up her muckle, um, so may not be here to vote, but she has got to get in the link to maybe join by telephone. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Councillor. And I don't think, I don't think I'm voting yes. I don't think it's showing up again. Okay. Uh, in that case, just waiting on a vote from Mayor Foster. Uh, the Mayor might have stepped away from his computer, so we'll say that is 13 votes in favour with the Mayor and Liz Kelly absent. And now we will go to the report of the Audit and Risk um, Subcommittee. Um, do officers wish to say anything in, in respect to this paper? Uh, through you, Madam Chair, no, I don't think so. It's um, <clears throat> self-explanatory in terms of the process from here on, unless uh, Councillor Condi wishes to uh, introduce it or, or say anything. Okay, I will get Councillor Condi to... Um, um, to move this paper, if you're okay with that, Councillor Condi. Sure thing. Uh, yes, I'm happy to move this paper. Uh, we had a good go through of the annual report, the draft annual report last time at Audit and Risk Subcommittee. And as we discussed in public excluded, uh, happy to recommend it to this committee at this point in the process, acknowledging that the audit is still ongoing. And so we may see, it's still possible, though hopefully unlikely, that we will see any minor changes um, before the audit comes through next week. Uh, and then we'll be able to have a, a fulsome public discussion of this at council next week. Thank you. Um, can I have a seconder for that, please? Um, uh, is it, oh, I think it's Deputy Mayor Free, you're on the committee, aren't you, subcommittee? Can't hear, I can't hear you. Are you, are you on the subcommittee? Sub maybe, sub maybe Sean could second it. Hey, Sean. <laughs> Sean, are you on the subcommittee? Yeah, he is. Okay, thank you. I'll take that as um, as a seconding. And if you could please um, vote. I don't, I don't know if anybody wants those put up on the screen. Always want them on the screen. Right. No amendments, good. I take it there's no debate. <laughs> I take it there's no debate. <laughs> Does anybody want to debate on this? <laughs> you can have a... Follow we'll debate at the um, council meeting next week when the actual document will be public. Yeah, oh, I'm gosh. voting for. Okay. Uh, so that is 14 votes in favour with Liz Kelly absent. It's carried. Okay, thank you. Um, now we will now move to um, the next substantive paper on our agenda, which is the Developments Contribution Policy Review. Um, we have had two good public workshops on that on on this, so which is um, really helpful, I think, um, in terms of um, helping our understanding, but also hopefully the public's understanding as well. A wee bit. Um, so I will now um, invite officers to introduce the paper, please. Uh, Kia councillors, colleagues, um, anybody on live stream. As Councillor Carlett mentions, we have had two workshops on this. Um, it was the main thing going on is an alignment of charges in the development contributions policy with the latest long-term plan. We're just looking for approval to consult today. Um, we think it will be of interest to developers, will be targeted in consultation, and that will be open to the public. Uh, there's lots of components, get participants from across the business, and um, there's a few other people 
listening in on the meeting who are able to respond to questions as well. Thank you. Um, um, what questions are there of officers? Um, I don't, oh, Mayor Foster. I think you might be on mute. I'm mute myself, yeah. Uh, a couple of quick questions. Um, thanks, uh, Leela. Uh, our our, um, our DCs are very, very low. And I guess that this is the first time, I think, correct me if I'm wrong, we've actually seen the sort of a little bit of a high level breakdown of, um, of how they're calculated, but not what the projects are within those which you've decided which are growth related and which aren't. You know, though, so you've got, you've got a man amount for one component of parks, which you said the global amount is dollars X and dollars Y is the, the, the growth. But I'd be, I'd be, I hate to say this, but I'd be interested in seeing how you've actually worked out which bits are growth related and which bits aren't growth related within those. Um, sure, I, I can make a brief comment and then we can open to, um, if we need more comment, there's Elizabeth Steele and <laughs> Marty on standby. Um, so there's a schedule to the policy. Um, it's got a breakdown of various projects. So they're not broken down 100%, but what happens is um, once it goes through the, the long-term plan, um, as things go into the long-term plan, they're identified by the greatest component of expenditure. So say if it's 60% growth, 20% renewal, 20% level of service, it gets classified as growth. Afterwards, um, they go through a process where they're unpicked and it's identified for each project that goes into the schedule attached to the policy, what proportion is for growth. Across the whole of city ones, it tends to land at around um, 7% on some of those, 7 to 11 seven to 10% on some projects. So it's done project by project and other projects it goes up to 80%. So we could do um, an extra briefing prior to when it comes back about the exact projects. There's, um, there's quite a lot of projects. Yeah, no, I, I, I would be, in, be interested in seeing that, that, um, that level um, because ours do seem very, very low. Um, so that takes me to the second question, which is you said that ours are lower because we don't, essentially ours are lower because we don't have a lot of green fields compared to some yeah. others. And yet our highest, uh, sorry, our green fields ones are still only the same as the um, the lowest levels of some of our, of our neighbours. So that kind of makes me struggle with that rationale. Mm. So um, a, a couple of those projects come in at quite high percentages. I know some of the roading ones out Granada, Lincoln Shireway come in at quite a high proportion. But again, they're, um, yeah, they're just a, a relatively lower proportion. So we can go through the, the schedules in detail um, prior, to, prior to coming back, I think, and have a more detailed look at some of those. Um, the funding analysts have worked with all the asset owners on the assumptions. But also the big new spending associated with growth has pulled through some larger components. So some of the water projects, um, DCs are going up by about $2,000 in some of the catchment areas. And those are related to the new reservoirs. And then some of those are also allocated across the city. So there are a few significant new projects then, although overall it's still low. Okay, and my, and my last um, two questions, one is, how much room to move on those if we sort of say actually that's that is growth related where you might have said it's not or there's a greater like greater proportion is growth related how much room do we have to move uh during the or post the consultation process that's the first question um, and um, the, second one, the second one is um at what stage do we have another look at this once particularly once we've done let's get wellington moving so, and make yeah. the decisions around that. Okay. So I'll answer the second question first. So the development contributions policy is what I think of as a, it's a follower policy. So decisions aren't set in it, but it rather reflects decisions that have been made about growth funding. So once significant changes have been made, like um, let's get Wellington moving, those changes can be pulled in. At this review, we've um, used the new template and updated the financial model. So it, it was quite an exercise this time around. As more changes come through in the next year or two, it can be quickly, more quickly and easily reviewed to take those into account. And on the first question, um, things, yeah, that we could have a look at some key projects, but 
um, they were quite carefully looked at. And it, it, it's a fact, you know, Wellington is at capacity to, uh, on a lot of things, and then the growth component can be fairly small. Uh, there's a lot of rigor into not overestimating on growth because then you'd have to pay back development contributions and become administratively more and more challenging. Um, but we can certainly look at some of the key projects and the growth assumptions. Thank you. Thanks very much. Thank you, Mayor. Um, Councillor Thurn. Hi, um, thank you so much for the work on this. Just um, the green building submission, just a couple of questions on how do we promote that? Because I went to look into our rate submission section and it's not in there. And I thought it would have been alongside the new homeowner section. So I just want to know how, where that sits and how we promote it. I want to understand more about um, the planning. And I think you may have just answered it through uh, Mayor Foster's question, but we're going to need a lot more green spaces and public spaces for people. Will these development contributions, the new policy enable us to be able to purchase more places for parks? And um, yeah, those are the two for now. Um, so I, again, um, I'll take the second question first, just in terms of the reserves. So there are um, quite a few new charges in there in the reserves space. Um, so I'm just glancing at the spreadsheet. So um, yeah, that is one thing to look at. Now, there's assumptions in the policy about how many square metres of reserve area you need per resident. And that's one of the things that we'll continue looking at and look at the next um, reviews as well and working with Beck Ramsey from Parks and Reserves. So we do have reserves, we do collect for reserves. Um, there's a couple of, and those are mainly citywide. And in newer areas, there's actually quite high costs, um, development charges on reserves. So that's out at Churton Stebbings. Um, there's also a cost on reserves in the in a city city area of over a thousand dollars per new development. Um, going back to the first question on the green building remission, mm. so I think it's been discussed, and I'm just going from information I've seen from officers who administer that in the past, and um, Liam's team and Matthew, um, that it's fairly well known to the to the big developer the the bigger developers in terms of the green building remission. And it, it's known amongst the people who do the big build, the big commercial buildings where it's known. I could um, could check if Marty knows more, but but that's where it is it is taken as known amongst the bigger developers. Um, that, that yes, I think just, is there. just to add to that uh, councillor the because it's a development contribution, it obviously doesn't sit alongside any rates or emissions policies or um, rates or rebates, so that you won't be finding the information there in the rating section on the website. Um, um, but it is, so, so the publicity is in the policy and um, it is well known um, amongst the development community. And I think there's there's been a few applications um, to date, um, some granted and some still in process. Um, for for those remissions, and okay. I, I, and just to add to the to the um, other part of the question, um, whilst you, I think the question was, can you does this provide investment funding for for green um, spaces? Uh, it it's recovering the the debt for investing in green spaces. It's recovering income to repay the debt for those green spaces. So the green spaces have to be planned in the LTP. Um, and and that's where the planning comes in, and this is the funding mechanism that that funds um, those green spaces. So in a way, the answer is yes, but it's not just a um, income source that you get to spend on on um, any green spaces. They have to be planned in the LTP. So LTP is the moment. That's right. Okay, one more quick question. Um, I did send through an amendment, but I am actually just so exhausted I'm not going to move it. But I just wanted to understand more about, you talked about DCs on smaller places, but then we weren't, didn't have the relative amount. So if I wanted to build a huge house, I wouldn't get any more DCs than, than the average. So, so what is the timeline for the work to be done on that? So, um, so it's some, 
and something that we're continuing to look at is how detailed you make the policy. So for example, in some areas that have differential rates for different kinds of commercial properties or different rates for um, uh, visitor accommodation or retirement homes or different ways of charging on floor space for, for properties. So that's something we've, we'll be continuing to look at as a way of making the policy more detailed. Part of the analysis we have to do to that on, around that is the cost benefit analysis of doing so for the complexity it adds to the policy and driving up the administration costs of the policy and whether it can feasibly be administered. Because when you're, you're, you're applying it to buildings and you have very little control over how many people are living in the building, it's based around assumptions about an average house and average household. So once you start sort of adding that level of detail, you can get two people living in a five bedroom home and you can get two people living in a one bedroom home. And so, so your policy has to cater for everything without becoming too cumbersome to administer. And, okay. and so we, we keep looking at that and um, looking at the different options and also operationally where, where the pinch points and challenges do come up. So we can report back more on those as yeah. a routine part when we come back. After that would be great. I think, yeah, that was all I was after really. So mm -hmm. that would be awesome. Um, so yeah. Councillor Fern, you're not intending to, you don't want your amendment? Okay, all right. So I think that's the questions of officers now. Um, I will um, um, move um, the recommendations as they are there now. Um, I think this is um, this is about going out for consultation. So it's not actually us making a decision here and now, but it's following on from our LTP. And um, if we want to um, 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 develop um, the city um, in line with the LTP, we need to make sure that our development contributions um, fit what we need to do. So this is essentially um, a proposal going out um, on the new fee structure, which will mainly be of interest to those ones, um, to um, developers who are focusing on larger um, developments. Um, and um, my understanding is that we have a channel of engagement with them, so they will certainly um, 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 be targeted in terms of this consultation. Um, I, um, I won't say anything further. I think we've had two good workshops on this and, um, and a, a fulsome paper. Um, I'm looking for a seconder as Councillor Foon. Thank you. Um, do you wish to speak? Um, would anybody else like to speak to this? No, can't see. Um, oh, Councillor Paul. Oh, you voted, sorry. No, I was voting. <laughs> okay, I'm taking you all, got them all done together. Great, so let's move to vote. Uh, can I just vote yes? I don't know how to do it on my phone. Yep, sure. I and and I'm, vote, <clears throat> I'm voting yes to everything. Thank and you. I know, and I know, I know we're voting, but I would just like to say thank you to the officers for all the work. I know that yes. there's been a lot in here. <laughs> So has it all been taken together? Because if it isn't, I'm voting yes to everything. Yes, Liz, we're, we're, we're on a roll now, Liz. Gosh, uh, that's 15 okay. votes in favour of it. That's unanimous. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, and, um, and thank you to officers for, for their patience in answering our questions. But I think it's, it's, um, it's in support of all the extra work that they put into making sure that we're as informed as possible, because I know five years on council, I haven't seen this um, sort of detailed presentation about development contributions, so thank you. Right, so we are all, we have two more papers to go. We did a suggestion to bring them together, but I think that might be far too confusing for us. So we will go straight now to the um, action tracking paper. And that's page 101 of your on diligent. Okay. Are there any questions of officers in, in respect to this paper? No, I don't see anything. 
Oh, okay. I, just very quickly. Oh, yes. Um, it, it might be quite good sometimes to put the forward program and the action tracking earlier on the agenda. Um, so we give it a bit more attention. <laughs> I'm not saying people haven't given it attention, but, um, you know, yeah. we always dealing with us not fresh. So just a suggestion. Yeah, no, um, good point, Councillor Matthews. And I think this meeting went a little bit longer than what we actually thought it might. So, um, yeah, but, but good points to note, I think, for this committee and others. Um, okay, so look, I will, um, I will um, move these recommendations of everyone, um, which is basically receive the information. Do I have a seconder? We'll put the hand up. Thank you, Councillor Day. Um, would you please um, vote? Oh, sorry, do you want to switch the speak? No, no one speak, let's vote. Thank you. Are we voting? Yep. Yes. It's, um, okay, I'm, I'm voting yes to everything. Okay. That's 15 <laughs> votes in favour, carried unanimously. Okay. And now we'll move to the final paper, which is the um, forward program. Um, are there any questions of officers? Okay. Um, Councillor Foon, sorry, did you have a question? Yes, please. Um, no, I can't I just, see you. Sorry. Can't you hear me? I can hear you now. I just couldn't see you. Okay. Sorry. That must have been a sad moment. Right. <laughs> <laughs> can I was you looking at me. <laughs> oh, sorry. I can see all these hands now. I was obviously, uh, I was looking at me, not anybody else. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, Councillor Finn. Construction industry context, Chief Infrastructure Officer. Can I just have a little bit of context around that pa paper coming up in Tuesday <laughs> team meeting, please? Yes, Councillor. Uh, <laughs> so, um, the, do you want to just pop it up to Siobhan as well? She's just there. Um, I'm just getting Siobhan in the room as well. Um, that is to provide us information on the sector and how it's responding post COVID, the capacity issues, what's happening in the supply chain, what's happening to prices. We need this paper to come just before, but very close to um, the capital. Re prior, re rescheduling paper, capital scheduling paper, um, so you understand how that translates onto our actual um, pipeline. There's, um, Siobhan might. Kia ora, councillors. Um, so the, the construction paper. Yeah, yeah so basically uh, we've undertaken a review of the construction sector and the capacity to deliver on our plan. Um, that includes both the actual contracting um, end of the supply chain as well as professional services, which is very constrained at the moment. Um, so that then informs, yes, how we re reschedule um, our capital program. So it's pretty much building that, that context and painting that picture for you as to what the reality of uh, the constraints are out there in the market, not just with people, but also with the supply chain. Cool. And I'm sure I'm going to stand on Councillor Rush's thunder, but just clarifying why is it coming to finance and performance? I know it's related, but will it go through infrastructure as well? No, it wasn't intending to. We wanted to do it all in one hit. <clears throat> So, I'm sorry, I mean, it's up to, it's up to councillors where, where you want that paper to go. We just want it to be close. Yeah. Chronologically close <laughs> to the, to the other paper and the rephasing, which we're linking into the overview of the quarterly reporting and then linking into the annual plan process budgeting. So um, we don't mind where, um, just the when, as long as they're close. I'm fine, but I don't know about Councillor Rush. <laughs> I, you know, I don't get parochial about these types of things, but but I have been attending the infrastructure industry meetings, and so probably have a little bit more um, background knowledge on what's going on, and, and might be able to assist or, or whatever. But I'll, I'll speak with um, the chair and 
you know, if there's any changes, then we can do it. But in the end, I, you know, as I say, I don't want to be broken about this. And the less in my committee means it's probably less that I have to do. But mm. everyone I, I just shirk my those, responsibility. Yeah, I was expecting those papers to come to our committee as well, Sean. So that was I. That's why I had them in our committee. I think it's a timing issue, but Councillor Rush, if it's any comfort, I'd, I'd be very more than happy for you to um, to move that paper. So and, and add your knowledge to it. Um, so My understanding was that there were also it was um, it affects not just the infrastructure, but it affects some projects in planning, environment committee, and affects some projects in social and rec. Absolutely. So the idea was to kind of bring it all together. Yeah. That's and right. that I'm most logical that. umbrella for that was probably finance and performance. So it's no reflection on anybody. It's just trying to make it sort of streamlined and logical. Well, it kind of goes to the heart of what the infrastructure committee will be doing next year. And so I'm not quite, I mean, obviously everything's got a finance aspect to it. But as I say, um, I'm you know, going to die in a ditch on it. So no. Brian, did you say that you were happy to move them? No, I'm gonna say you would have I would be happy for you to move that paper. But um yeah, it's not a it's 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 really making right. sure we've got all Look, the relevant right. papers together to um, it's been a long enough day as it is, so yeah. I'll, I'll have a chat to you separately, but okay, cool. I'm not that fast. But okay, thank you. Obviously we'll I am a little bit <laughs> <laughs> we'll work it, we'll work it out. Okay, cheers. All right. Uh, any other questions of officers? No. Thank you. Uh, Okay, look, um, I will um, move um, um, move this motion that we received this information in here. Um, as, as all the committees, the forward program is a bit of a, um, a, um, a, a very agile in terms of what gets um, on here um, and things do get moved around. And occasionally, sometimes with timing, papers do have to be on the other committees um, to ensure that um, the flow does work to make the right decisions in the right order. Um, I, um, Councillor Flynn, did you want to um, second this? Mm -hmm. Yep. Thank you. Um, so, um, um, do you wish to speak? No. Okay. Thank you. And um, does anybody wish to speak to this paper? No. Okay. Well, um, um, if you could all vote accordingly, which is essentially receive the information. Uh, that's 15 votes in favour. Thank you. Very. Excellent. Um, look, thank you. Um, thank you, everyone. Just before I do the um, conclude the meeting, um, I just want to thank um, everyone here and also the officers. It's, it, 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 um, um, the order of the papers didn't go quite according to plan, but that's why we can be agile. Um, but thank you, officers, for your guidance and your patience and ability to um, um, support us um, through making these decisions. Um, so it was quite a lengthy meeting um, today. Um, and so look, um, I will just say the um, closing um, karakia. Ona here, ona here, ona here, kichi ura tapanui, kiawatia, kiamama, tenako, tutanana, te wairua, iti ara takatu, koira eronga, akaria aki pirunga, kiawatia, kiawatia. Ira Kuwatia. Thank you all and um, go out and enjoy some sun now. If you